subpoena as well? I don't believe he received a defense subpoena. No, Judge. All right, so we don't have to address it just yet then if it's not applicable. How about after Detective Cole? It'll be Scott Craig. Scott Craig. All right, and is he under defense subpoena? Yes, Judge. All right, so we will address this in between those two witnesses because I know all of the jurors are here and I want to get going right away, okay? And then that will give me an opportunity to review it. Um, my guess is we'll probably have a mid-morning break before the next, before Mr. Craig testifies. So, all right, anything else we need to address this morning from the state? No. From the defense? Yes, Judge. Uh, I'm not sure what court document it is, but the state did file a letter with the court dated January 19, 2023, regarding things they wanted redacted on the interviews that the detectives Cole and Hoppy and other detectives had with our client, Jesse Kraczewski. And we were going to address that today, I believe, prior to testimony. Is this the witness who will be going through that? There is one interview that will be played with Detective Cole this morning from March of 2019. Is there any redactions that you, the state has done with that? Yes, Judge, because we've never ever received a response to that communication from January, we've prepared all of our exhibits per the redactions in that letter. Um, that's not to say that all content other than the redaction is something the state intends to play, um, but that is the um, redactions that we deem to be appropriate and those are the ones that have been made in our completed exhibits at this point. They generally follow along two different paths, one being information in regard to the defendant's own criminal history, convictions, time in prison, felon status, and the other being the decedent's prior history, um, things that this court addressed last week that have been redacted out where appropriate. So the format that these interviews take now is various clips because I wasn't able to simply mute portions. I, we actually physically clipped out the pieces that we believed were not appropriate to play. Um, again, that was done some time ago now. And I believe it, at at least the past two or three hearings we've had on this case, I had asked and made a record to the court that that list had been provided uh, and asked that if there's any objections to it, those be filed. This court did agree and set a deadline on objections to that list and nothing was ever filed. So I think that at this point, uh, any discussion about that is untimely. How long do you anticipate your direct of Detective Cole and the showing of these video clips to take? Probably, I believe that the clip is around 30 minutes and I think that I may have 20 to 30 minutes of questions. So around an hour. So I wanna do this, I wanna be mindful all jurors are here. Um, and that the state is obviously going to present uh, the evidence in the fashion that it has outlined. Before I take up cross and any requests, well, not requests, but statements from the defense related to this, um, I'll excuse them. But I want to get going this morning. I think that's appropriate. Um, and especially in light of some of the procedural history as it relates to these issues. So, um, all right, so that's how we'll address that. With that, Madam Clerk, you can have the jurors brought out.
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. All right, the state may call its next witness. Thanks, Judge. The state calls Chris Paul. Good morning, sir. If you would please make your way to the witness stand. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names with, state your first and last names for the record and spell each. It's Chris Cole, C-H-R-I-S-K-O-H-L. Mr. Cole, are you currently employed with law enforcement in any capacity? Yes. And what do you do? I'm a patrolman with the a village of Houstonsford in Dodge County. Okay. Do you have prior law enforcement experience? Yes. Where? I've spent most of my career with Waukesha County Sheriff. How long did you work with them? 25 years. Okay. Around 2018, what were your job duties with the Sheriff's Department here in Waukesha? I was a detective. Okay. Are you familiar with someone named Jesse Krzyzewski? Yes. Do you see her in the courtroom? Yes. Could you please identify her by where she's seated? She's sitting at the defense table. Now, did you become involved in an investigation that involved Ms. Kerchewski? Yes. And was that around October of 2018? Uh, it was January of 19. Okay, can you tell the jury how you got involved in that case? I was contacted by the medical examiner's office, referenced uh, a toxicology report that they had received, referenced the, the death of Lynn Hernan, um, which had occurred in October of 2018. Got it. After that point in time, were you part of the team that investigated the death of Lynn Hernan? Yes. Um, is it fair to say that after January of 2019, the investigation changed from what it was in October? Yes. Why? Uh, the toxicology report received by the medical examiner's office showed a substance in Ms. Hernan. Um, it's believed to be, and excuse me if I mispronounce this, Tetrahyzinine. Okay. It's the active ingredient in visine or eye drops, okay. which is a poison to the human body. From that time forward, would it be fair to say that the investigation had a lot of officers working on it? Yes. Were some of those officers working on a financial aspect of the case? Yes. Okay. Was that you necessarily? No. Okay. Um, was at this point in time was the investigation a homicide investigation? It was a death investigation when I started it. Eventually, did you gather evidence for this death investigation? Yes. Did that even include getting some records from a probate case? Judge, I'm object to leading. This is background at this point? Yes. All right, overruled. Did you even get some things from a probate case? Yes. Okay. So I want to ask you some specific questions about the discussions. Did you speak with Ms. Kershewski in regard to this death investigation? Yes. And was the first time in March? I believe so. Okay. And that would be of 2019, is that true? Correct. Okay. Do you remember why or how you came to be in an interview with Ms. Kershewski at that time? She contacted our office looking for an update on the death investigation. Did that prompt you to make contact with her? Yes, I, I don't recall if she, I, I believe she contacted dispatch and then I, I called her back. Now, before that time, had you ever spoken with Ms. Krzyzewski before? No. Did you know her in any way prior to this event? No. Okay. So, 
throughout your time working on this case, would it be fair to say that was several years? Yes. During that time, did you have occasion to hear Ms. Krzyzewski's voice on many occasions? Yes. Do you think that you can identify her voice at this point? Yes. Okay. What I'd like to do now is, um, I'd like uh, Mr. Volkanier, if you could please queue up Exhibit 60. Detective Cole, do you know whether that call to dispatch from Ms. Krzyzewski was recorded? Almost all calls to dispatch are recorded. Okay. Have you even heard the call that is relevant to this case before? Yes. Okay. In that call, were you able to identify the caller, who the caller was? Yes. And who was it? It's Ms. Krzyzewski. Okay. Did the recording that you heard seem to be a fair and accurate copy of, of that call from dispatch? Yes. I move Exhibit 60 into evidence, ask for permission to publish. Objection. Exhibit 60 is received permission to publish is granted. And Detective Cole, would that call to dispatch have any video with it? No. Okay, so it's just audio? Yes. Okay. And I believe we tested the audio system out this morning, Judge, so I think that this should work. It's about uh, five and a half minutes long, and I would just ask Ms. DeVolcanier to play. Before she plays, I'd like to uh, read to the jury uh, instruction 158. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are about to hear an audio recording. Recordings are proper evidence and you may consider them just as any other evidence. Listen carefully, some parts may be hard to understand. Go ahead. Blocks County Communications, it's Blocks County Communications, it's Jeff. Um, yes, I'm calling. Um, I'm trying to find out some information and I don't have a case number of who is working on it. Okay. I have a last name and the person who it is on, and basically I'm just trying to find out some information. Okay. I don't know who it's supposed to be. All right. Do you remember where the incident happened? Um, it happened in Kiwaki. Um, what it was was the medical examiner is the one who gave me the number for you guys. Okay. What what kind of information are you looking for? I'm trying to figure out who's working on her case. Okay. What kind of case? I don't know. The medical examiner just gave me the phone number and it said it was referred to you guys. Okay. So is it reference to death then if you were talking to the medical examiner? Okay. Yeah. And what is the subject's last name? H-E-R-N-A-N. -E and the first name is Lynn. Okay. L-Y-N-N? -N? Correct. Any idea when it happened? Um, she passed away October 3rd of last year. Okay. But I don't know when it was referred to you guys. Or I don't I don't know anything about that. Basically, I've been checking with the medical examiner because we're trying to figure out she was in the hospital before she passed. This was something the hospital should have caused or whatnot, what's going on. And it, it's the medical examiner hasn't had any information in months, and then she just said now that it was referred to your department. Okay. Now, which which department? We dispatched for 20 different police agencies. She said the sheriff's department in Waukesha. Okay. I am not finding anything with that last name, but they don't always put the name in the call for a decedent. Um, let's see. You don't know the address where it happened or anything like that? Her address is N16W265432. And it's Meadow Grass Circle. Okay. Well, 
What's the phone number I can have a deputy call you at? 414-514-1039. Okay. Do you know what unit number she was in? I don't. Okay. Oh, unit for her apartment, you mean? Yes. Unit A. I'm sorry. I didn't even think you had the address. Okay. That's okay. All right. Okay, is that short for anything? No. Nope. Your middle initial? R. And just for our record, your date of birth? 2-18-1984. All right, Jesse, I will have a deputy give you a call, okay? Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye. Detective Cole, after that call was made, did you meet with Ms. Kraszewski? Yes. Where was that meeting? At the Sheriff's Office. Okay. Who was there? Myself, Detective Hoppy, Jesse, and her mother, Jennifer. Do you know whether that meeting was recorded? It was. Have you seen that recording? Yes. Do you know if it fairly and accurately captured the conversation that you had that day? Yes. Okay. Um, have you reviewed the recording in its entirety? Yes. Would it be fair to say that there, there are parts of it that aren't really relevant for why we're here today? Yes. And have you also seen a version of that interview that um, is clips instead of a full length? No. Okay. But you know that there are pieces that aren't really relevant for what happened to, is happening here. Judge, yes. in based upon what he thinks is relevant. I'm going to ask for a sidebar. Overruled, he may answer. You know that there are pieces of that interview that have been, have been taken out and, the, and that the jury's not going to see those. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Uh, at this point, Judge, I move Exhibit 55 into evidence, ask for permission to publish. No objection. Exhibit 55 is received, permission to publish granted. And if we can please go to slide one. Now, oh, sorry, slide two. <laughs> Detective, at the top um, of the video screen, is there actually a date and time stamp that the uh, video put on this video? Yes. And what's that date? It's March 6, 2019, just before 10 a.m. Okay. Does this look like the beginning of that um, interview that you had in this case? It is. Okay. And then, uh, for the record, the timestamp for this clip is in the lower left of the exhibit, and the time is associating with the clock running at the top of the video. Before you play that, I want to read a... Instruction 158, uh, again this time for audio and video recordings. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are about to hear and view an audiovisual recording. Recordings are proper evidence and you may consider them just as any other evidence. Listen carefully. Some parts may be hard to understand.
Jessie and her mother. I'm sorry. Oh, anyway. hey, Jessie. You have a seat right there. We're going to grab it. We'll grab you another chair. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Aaron. Aaron. Okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah, she was a good friend with Lynn, so she kind of wanted to know what's going on. Too. Thank you. Uh, theoretically, I am assigned to this case. Okay. But um, we have we got a new boss here with a little bit ago and kind of changed protocols on us. Because okay. back in the day, I remember doing this a long time. Sure. Um, we didn't look at this stuff. Yeah, me kind of called out and said, you're all good. And now he has us investigate a kind of back burner. Sure. Um, so when you call, yeah, I knew the name and I had glanced over it. Yeah. But I'm waiting for the ME to call me and say, hey, we're all done. That's terrific. It's signed. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. So I was a little um, surprised when you sent the phone. You had concerns about the hospital. I, you know, when I talked to the medical examiner last, uh-huh. um, well, I talked to him numerous times. The first couple times they said there was a few issues as far as health-wise. She had like five things. Uh-huh. Then they said they were weighing on toxicology. Uh-huh. And then they said um, they sent out second samples or tissues or something. And then they stopped saying anything, and they said I had to contact you guys. And that's when I got the so, boss. Okay. <laughs> and I'm oh. going, I just want to know, like, because they kind of, like, weren't sure we didn't know if it was a suicide or if it was something medical. She was in the hospital shortly before. She'd been sick for years. We really weren't sure, you know, if this is something, because the doctors could never figure out what was going on. Mm-hmm. So it was frustrating, and she had literally probably ten boxes of medical documents. Okay. And, you know, we just didn't know. And, I mean, I know what state she was in and where she was at, but I didn't. You know, it's kind of frustrating because I was there all mm-hmm. the time taking care of her. I'm the one who took her to the doctor. I'm the one who did everything. So the not knowing, you know, and I wasn't there with right there her. Is a medical so issue it bothers me because I go, I could I have been there? Could I have helped? Could I have done something? You know, that's my hardest part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've, I've never found anybody before, and it's. Not something I ever want to do again. So, um, the medical examiner—they're very thorough. Yeah, I barely graduated high school. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they're super smart when they talk to me. Sometimes oh, I'm like, hey, 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 well, you got to figure it out. Well, bit. that's when they were talking to me. I'm going, I don't know what that means. I'm sorry, I don't understand. You know. <laughs> so. So um, at this point, I mean, they're waiting for their their secondary. They're con- they call them confirming tests. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there doesn't appear there's no trauma to the body. Nothing like that. She had medical issues, yeah. which I think is pretty well documented with her medical <laughs> record. Yeah. Well, I want to know. That's what I want to know. If it's in her head. If this has been five years worth in her head. It's frustrating that the doctors could never find anything. You uh-huh. know? And, I mean, they found little things, but not. She they just kept doing repeat checks. For years. three months. I mean, she had a bowl of soup once a week. Yeah. And she had such stomach issues, and she was just frustrated. And finally, the last time we went in, which was four days before she passed, uh-huh. that she was she got out. She was in for two weeks, and and where'd she go, Waukesha? Um, no. Pro Healthcare Waukesha. Waukesha Memorial, yeah. right, just up the road. Um, the hospital right up the road. Or was she not in the clinic or the hospital? No, she was admitted to the ER, and then they. Oh, um, but it was it was Pro Healthcare. It was right here, I think. I thought it was walkie shots. She was th- this is walkie shots. Yeah, it's pro health care is WMH. Yeah, I know actually I'm close, to, close to here because there was like yeah. the same exit. You know, so. And you said in the lobby that you and Miss Hernan were friends? Yeah, she's my best friend. How long, how long have you known her? Over 30 years. Did high school together or something? No. We lived in apartments. Okay. So she was like an aunt, a second mom to me. She didn't have kids. So you've known her your whole life? Yeah. And that's kind of, and that's why you were helping her out there. Yeah. yeah. Well, she power of attorney and all everything. She switched um, her medical like the last six months. My mom was in charge of everything, and she switched it because with her working and her hours, it was hard for her to get a hold of her. Mm-hmm. So my hours were different, and I could help her. So she basically, I mean, towards the end, I was taking her on doctor appointments, picking up her prescriptions, doing everything, and. Okay. Uh, the last, she was supposed to get in-home health care from the hospital. That was the only way they were going to release her because they mm-hmm. wanted her to go to inpatient, and she refused. In fact, she was that coming then, home health care? Because yeah. the report says you were the caregiver. Yeah. Um. <laughs> no, um, home health care, they called. They were supposed to come that Tuesday or Monday, 
And um, I remember if it was Tuesday or Monday. But they were supposed to come. She pushed them back to Friday. And they actually called because they kept calling. And I finally answered the phone and said she's no longer because they were trying to come out. That was her condition upon her release um, was they wanted to make sure somebody was there with her. I was there with her. Um, but they also, she had to have in-home health care. When you say you were given care and you got you were certain levels of care. I wasn't an RN by any That's what I was going to You don't have training. You she used to be. You weren't given actually, injections. No, 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 no. I basically administer. would help her to the bathroom, do any errands she needed, make any, if she needed. I mean, she never made her own when she needed to be cleaned yeah. up. She, um, right before the hospital, she had a few accidents, you know, on the way to the bathroom, stuff like that. So I helped her around the house, but I didn't. She used to be an RN, and mm -hmm. she was. To the point where, because she knew Lynn did not want to go, she was going, debating and quitting her job to actually physically take care of her. How long ago, How long were you taking care of her? Uh, it was just shortly, I would say. A little bit before she went into the hospital. I mean, I was out there pretty much every other day, but I wasn't, like, still so like, doing her shopping. Yeah. yeah. I would say a few months, but then, like, towards, towards the end, I was back and forth twice a day. Okay, so... so for the last, let's see. I'd say six months. Last six months? Yeah. You're out there every couple of days. Yeah. And then the last few weeks, you're out there pretty Pretty often. daily. Yeah. Daily. Once, twice a day. And you're helping her. Yeah. Are you administering the medication at all? No. She's taking care of her own pills? Yeah. Um, but you're picking them up from the yeah. pharmacy? Which pharmacy are you going to? Um, Walgreens. It's, um, it's right off of her main road. I'm not a walk shop person. So... But it's the closest Walgreens to her. And if you want um, to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they knew me very well. They knew her very well as well. But and what, did she have, like, Express Pay pet up, set up, or did you pay cash? No, or? she used it. We used her card. Used her card? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, were you, was she paying you to do this? Or just yeah. Friend? Yeah. No, well, I mean. I have a friend and a friend. Yeah. <laughs> again, um, my father got real sick last yeah. year and passed away. Um, and so I know where this stuff goes, and I was going there all the time. Yeah. He knows, and it's a little hard. And, um, uh, and one of my coworkers said, well, you should be paying yourself to, to take care of your parents. I'm like, well, I'm not, I can't take the kids. No, she, she always, you know, would offer here and there, and, you know, but it's it's hard, too, because, yeah, you you know, when somebody, you, she had no family, she had nobody. Oh, you know, well, I guess, yeah. Us, so, um, it's just, yeah, it's hard. So when you walk around through the stuff, you were just using her credit card? Yep. I mean, sometimes, obviously, that was coming from my house. Where, where was, was she in disability then? Or she, she was on um, Social Security or disability. One of them. Medicare disability. But I got the form at the end of the year, but I don't know if it was Social Security yeah. or disability. It was one of them. Okay. I think it might have just been Social Security. Okay. But she's been on that for five years. It's based on what I've read in our files, been our contacts mm -hmm. over the years. She was like a hairdresser in a salon yeah. or something. Yep. Um, she made a lot of money doing that, or? Um. She didn't really have any family. No. Based on what I can tell. Yeah, it's one distant cousin. She had, um, her parents passed away about four. Her dad passed away three, a couple years, five years ago. Her mom passed away, yeah. and she passed away, I think it was like a year, two years later. Was it two? I don't know. I think about two years later. Because I helped her move. Her okay. Mom's, yeah. Sell her mom's house. And yeah, well, she doesn't family. have any family. So. I mean, well, she did, her aunt... But she passed away too old yeah. a year ago. They, they were all from Madison. That's where she was originally from. So. Okay, could we couldn't really find anyone to call. I guess the medical examiner said there was a cousin or somebody it's like called. It's right. It's right. It's right. So it's okay. Distant I, cousin, didn't, so. I didn't know of them. So. Okay. And you had power of attorney medically? Yeah. You have, did you have financial power of attorney? Um, no. No. No, yes. If if need be, I think so. Or you did. I don't remember. I know I still have all the forms at home. So. <laughs> okay. And uh, what happened to her apartment and stuff? Um, we did an estate sale. Uh, me and Anthony, the other um, family or family friend, just like us. Um, his mom is friend. Of these two. Um, the two younger ones. But we emptied out. Was it Anthony your brother or cousin? Or? No, it no, was a family friend. It's just like her. It was somebody she went to hair school with. She had another friend. friend, Kareen, who I know. Else, else their son. Yeah. So these two are 
So we got the, she's got the house up here yeah. and then sold. So now. Do you know Kareen's last name? Um. Do a number for her. Yeah. Last While you're looking for it, we just yeah. get some basic information because we kind of jumped the gun here. Yeah. Um, it's J E S S Y. Correct. Middle initial. R. And your last name? K U R C Z E W S K I. Thank you for spelling it for me without me asking. No problem. Um, your date of birth? 21884. Address? Um, 10562 West Cortez Circle. Apartment 26, Franklin, Wisconsin, 53132. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty strong. Sorry. Again. What's, what's the zip? 53132. 53132. Correct. And your phone? 414-514-1039. And you work somewhere? Yes. Where was that? Uh, well, actually, no. Sorry. I'm not there anymore. <laughs> Smiles for Miles is my last position. But you're unemployed now? Yes. Okay. And Kareem? I can't think of her last name off campus. I'm calling her. It's 414 916 1010. I can't think of her last name. But she did friends like you a long time. Do you meet any of her friends? No. No, she, she went to. Know. She just knows her. She went. No, stop. She went to um, beauty school with her. Okay. And then her son is Anthony. And why would she give the stuff to Anthony? Just because she needed somewhere to put her stuff? Or? No, she was going to leave everything to me, but she figured, that, okay, if I died first, uh -huh. then who's going to get it? So she left it to the two younger ones that yeah. she knows. Okay. Do you know him at all or no? Um, we know each other, but not, not well. <laughs> His name was Anthony? Is yes. Do a number for him? Yeah. We know each other more, so. I know Kareem, and I know from Anthony, too. Okay. From all this, I mean, we've all kind of intertwined. Um, his is. Uh, let me ask you this: When you're looking again, how are you doing? Because you seem built upset on the phone. It, you know, it's it's just frustrating the not knowing. That's what bothers me the most. Because I feel like, had I have been there, could I have done something? That's what I really. And it's just, you know, I Kareem calls me every week or so, checking in. Um, I spent three, four months cleaning up her condo, getting rid of things, and that was hard. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's frustrating because I I feel like she was so close to us, and I feel like, you know, if she would have just reached out maybe a little bit more, or... Well, she did, and you just didn't know what was wrong with her. Okay. Okay. I don't know if I didn't feel head. free to chime in here, but... You're taking her to the doctor. She was in the hospital two weeks prior to her passing. I mean, it's not. Like you're talking. Were... These are. This is calls like throughout the night, yeah. during the day. It's all the time, yeah. and this has been going on for. She years. before the hospital, she five years. fell three times. And me and her neighbor tried to pick her up, which she was very. Heavy. She's very tall. Um, she gained a lot of weight with her stomach issues, and I mean, we literally were fighting with her on the floor trying to get she, her. Yeah, she's and her neighbors. Strong probably 10 years older than her mm -hmm. and I mean her neighbor was just shocked because she was so sick and she sat there for probably two three weeks before she finally we got her to go into the hospital mm -hmm. and it was just frustrating because it's like you need help you need and she was frustrated because she was she kept going in I mean she ambulance she go in but then she turned around and leave well that's Does she have um, some psychological things going on yeah. I don't I mean, I've never met I mean, so I, mean, I, I looked into her records, which I don't know if you have access to. But, <laughs> the uh, hospital yeah. has a lot of notes on her. Um, she would go in, and they would release her right away. Um, I don't think they know what to do. I don't know exactly what they would say. And half of what she said, you couldn't believe, because um, she told the doctor, I'm fine, I'm eating. And I told them outside and say, no, she's not. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she. That's so it's hard. But she said that none of, they all thought she was psychotic, and... All these yeah. things listed on her medical records, you know, yeah, that she saw a psychiatrist, yeah. she did. You know, so I don't know if it was what she was seeing or what they really thought. I don't know. You know, that's what was frustrating is because she would tell you one thing, but it would be different. So it would be different when you talk to the doctors. So. Mm -hmm. um, Anthony's is 414-916-1026. Mm -hmm. And you know his last name either. I, I do know both. Of, they're the same. Um... You know what, I can find out what, um, yeah, well, why are you looking? I said stomach issues. Is she have diarrhea or is she throwing up? Both. But she, 
she saw a um what is the stomach doctor? She said gastrointestinal. She saw somebody probably now. three, four years back, and ever since then, they prescribed a ton of medications, changed her diet, and she never was the same after that. Based on your observations, was she taking her medication properly? Because, <laughs> no. I mean, no. um, they find her. Yeah. Obviously, you found her. Yeah. There's there was everywhere. everywhere. No, um, the hospital, when she was there and they noticed, they put an actual camera in her room. Um, she had me go to Walgreens and get her prescriptions because they weren't giving her her regular meds. Um, she would, they, so she pulled off all her um, stuff. I went in one day and I'm like, why is there a camera in here? And they said, well, we're having some problems. Mm -hmm. um, she was never good with her medication. She was really big on her Xanax, was her big one. Mm -hmm. She never took it. She always was taking more of it than what she needed. The doctors wanted to um, cancel her on Yeah, when she was in, they took her off of it. These and items wanted. that she would have already purchased when, when the doctor was giving them to her, so she'd stockpile on stuff. Uh -huh. yeah. did, she doc, did she have a doctor shop? They called doctor shop. We had multiple doctors prescribing the same stuff. I don't know. No, she didn't. She'd do that. Um, okay. Because, as a matter of fact, the doctor she had, um, took her want, off. One, we took her off stuff, and then said, "I want you to see another doctor because I can't. I prescribe these oh, things for you anymore." So, because people can, people have used Xanax. Posa. Posa. O Z Z A. That's mom and mom and son. They are they're both the same. Are they local? I assume they're local. For um, they live in Big Bend, I think. Okay. Yeah. So they're in the metro area. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If we could please go to slide three. Erin, this is Jesse and her mother. I'm sorry. I'm <coughs> sick. Um, towards the end, she really wasn't. Um, I would say probably the last two weeks. Not that I know of, was she? Prior to that, yeah. If you're there twice a day and someone's hitting it, you know it. Yeah. I mean, because <laughs> you're taking the trash yeah. out. No, she... She had three bottles when she passed away still. So, as far as I know, no. Okay. Um, before that... Because she, she was hospitalized for like two weeks, days. and then she's out for like four days. Four days. Yeah. And then she passes. Yeah. So, and as far as I know, she was just drinking And water. historically, based on my hospital experiences, yeah. they don't let you drink in the no. hospital. <laughs> no. no, but she drank in the morning, too. She yeah. drank whenever... I mean, prior to yeah. her being sick the last couple of weeks where she wasn't drinking anything. Because yeah. she couldn't eat. She wouldn't... She couldn't get anything done. And, do you know why she's gaining weight if she's not eating? Exactly. <laughs> we we couldn't figure it out. Was it water weight or she something? She was. I, I know when she first went in, she was very bloated. Because I can tell you why I got yeah. it. <laughs> well, she's a good eater. They, I mean, she was she loved very, cook, but she's not. She was not eating. Sure. But when she, she okay, for when, years. when she went in the last time though, they kept feeling her stomach because they said the same thing. And they took x-rays, and they just said she was extremely bloated, but they don't know from what. Okay. Um, because they would actually push on, and she was in excruciating pain. The medical examiner gets access to all the medical yeah. records by statute. So, yeah. I mean, and again, I don't tell them, doctors, uh, yeah. what, you know, they <laughs> tell me what happened. Yeah. Um, were you going there to see her at all, or not? At no, I hadn't been out there in a while to see her. When was the last time you saw her, do you think? I don't, I don't know. I'd say maybe two months. Two months prior to her death? Yeah, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. At least prior to her hospital stay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think the only people that she really saw in the last month was me and the neighbor. The neighbor went to the hospital. So she didn't want nobody. Out. She didn't want anybody out. If somebody said they were coming out, other than her or I, she would tell them. Don't come? No. Is it June or Judy? Next door. Yeah. Jean. Sorry, I'm wrong. I don't know her last name, but I do. I think it's in the report. Yeah. Because she, she was there as yeah. a doctor that day. Yeah. Jean Tunnell. Yeah. yeah. And she was right next door? Yeah, she was right next door. Okay. Yeah, because she helped me and pick her up, I think, two days. Do you have a number for Jean? Yeah. And we have one, but I want to make sure sometimes. No, that's fine. There's nothing more frustrating. Our deputy sometimes get a little easy when it gets to phone numbers. 262. Uh huh. Eight nine three, three four eight three. Was she helping her out too, besides you, or mostly just you? Um, she would help a little if I wasn't there. Um, Lynn would call her like, cause she called quite a few times if she needed something or she fell or 
And if I couldn't get there quick enough, she would try calling her. Mm-hmm. Um, so she would help, or if I knew I was going to be gone, you know, and I knew she was having a bad day, I'd say, you know, can you check in on her or stuff like that. So, and I know she came and visited her once or twice in the hospital, too. Okay. Any other neighbors that she... No. I mean, they all knew her, but she wasn't really close with a lot. She did have one guy friend that lived further over that would stop every so often, but he didn't even... She pretty much blew everybody off possible at the end. Um, a lot of people were upset um, because they'd call and they'd say, oh, I'm stopping over, and she'd say, no, I don't want to see anybody. Or when she was in the hospital, I said, do you want me to call anybody? No, I don't want to. She just Sometimes you don't feel well, you don't yeah. want to see no one. No. She, she had paranoia. She'd never leave her house. That's yeah. why she'd do a shop, and even if she could shop, she wouldn't. She, um, just she wasn't, got a certain time. She was a very, like, five years before this was, from when I was little to five years ago, she was a completely different person. Fun of the party, knew everybody, would bring hors d'oeuvres to the pool for everybody. I mean, she was just a completely different person. Mm-hmm. And after her parents died and she got sick, she kind of just withdrew from everybody and everything. She didn't. If we could please go to the next slide. Check. Uh- Can I get your name? Is it Jenny or Jennifer? Jennifer. And on the show? M. Last name? Flower. Date of birth? 12-26-1963. Address? Uh, same as... The Cortez? Yep. You have a cell phone? 414-460-5792. Anything else you want to tell me? Things from Florida, even a small detail. No, I, there's not that. Connected. I mean, the crime scene pictures, I reviewed them before you came here. Uh, obviously, it looks like she was trying to force down medication. Um, the doctor will tell me yeah. if that's true or not. Um, do I think it's a suicide? Yeah. Do you I think she. Because of her psychological issues? Yeah. And I think when she went in the hospital, that was it for her. That was the last straw. They couldn't find nothing. She she was going to tell them whatever she wanted to to get out of there. And I told her that. I said, she just wants to come home because she's going to do herself in. She was just very, I don't, she was just tired of being sick. Mm-hmm. And she was frustrated because she wasn't getting the answers. Um, I do know when she first went in, they said she had liver kidney. She thought she was going to have to go on dialysis. Within a day that improved, they said no. Then they, after her being there five days, they said she has C. Diff. She was so excited thinking that was like all her problems. Well, you get and then she realized that wasn't, that wasn't, so that's not you know, that. they made her, I think, with what they told her and what she believed, she got excited thinking they finally figured out what's wrong. She actually thought, you know, she even had her water checked in her house when she bought the condo, the upper upstairs. Uh, she had them checked for mold. She had a lot yeah, of Yeah, I mean, she, she was like, the apartment was everything. herself was making her sick, or the condo. How long, how long did she live there? I think, it, I think it was four years since her parents. Four years? I thought it was like three, but... Well, it's either three or four. How about three to four? <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> I know I got the paperwork, guys. Yeah. Is there an attorney that's handling the estate? Yes. Mm-hmm. Who's that? Lisa Martinson. And the next slide, please. Can I get your name? I had two friends, and they had set things they wanted. And... Those were the two people she said, I do not want them in my house when she passed. Um, Who's that? She, um, what's Green Feather's name? Uh, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. It's Green's brother and then uh, Jim, her ex boyfriend. And they both wanted the same things, and they were the things worth of some value. What did they want? Um, she had a very expensive bracelet that she bought about a year before she died. Um, it was a men's Merner Link bracelet, and that was the first thing they both asked for. It was in. I have never seen one so the sick other one knew. over. <laughs> I mean, I was like disgusted over what. You know, they didn't say how did she die. Uh, you know, what? when's the funeral, when's the... They didn't ask any of that. They asked, when can I come to her house? Or who's getting the bracelet? I want the bracelet. I mean, actually, Jim set his mom up to ask for the bracelet, too. So that was three people, and she would never... I mean, it was sick. How long 
How long was Jim the ex-boyfriend? Over 30 years. They were dated 30 years ago? Yeah. Not that long ago, but <laughs> yeah, it was. I don't think it was the point. No. They lived at the apartments. So that's when I met her. And they spoke up. Maybe 20 years ago. No. She did a lot for him. A lot. And that's hanging out in 20 years. Well, Jim's getting yeah, He's got a girlfriend, too. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Well, it's okay, because he broke up 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's just it's a weird... Well, she's I'm, one I'm, in, I'm in cahoots with that guy right now. <laughs> I've had some conversations with him. Um, yeah. I'm also aware of the fact that she has given him money for her down payment on his house and only paid him back like $300. How much did she give him? A lot. When you say a lot, you have documents? Yeah. And he knows we know. Because <laughs> those are my exact words to him. He actually also has very good friends who work for this office. Does he? Yeah. His wife's a court reporter for Waukesha, too. Girlfriend. Attorney. Please. Um, person. Um, well, he, he created, created a lot of stuff too. Is really not. His he created name. a lot. His of name is not in him, so why should he? It's not his. He, um, he was very determined to be in her house and get certain things. She had strict. Who gets what? We abided by it. Um, but he. Did he get anything? Yeah, he did. He got way more than what, because I didn't have a problem with giving away her things. Do you have an itemized list that you gave me? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll give you a card as my email on it. You want to email me? Yeah. I also have her itemized list, too. You want to email me that? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, he's he's been um, an issue. I don't, we don't have any conversations with him anymore, but at the beginning, he was a problem. Did he have he, contact with her toward the end? No. No. He tried, he tried uh, when she was in the hospital, he tried... Uh, he called when she was in the hospital. Yeah, he called. Yeah, he was mad that he wasn't informed. He had a I birthday said, gift to drop off for her, and I said, well, she's in the hospital right now, and her birthday was in June, so why are you calling now? Uh -huh. yeah. And she said, do not tell him I don't want him here, I don't want to see him. She didn't like the way she looked, so she didn't want people around, okay. because she always was done off. Oh, so good, and yeah. she's... You know, so hot yeah. at the end of yeah. this time. You never look so good when you're dead. <laughs> um, no. no, and uh, the brother is Corinne's I, brother. I, I can't think of his name offhand. Um, let me think of it. Send me an email. Yeah. Or but um, the two of them, I, we had a dinner. But you're pretty meeting. sure Jim's not around just at the end of No. 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 Do you have a he, phone number for him? He has a phone number. I don't want to have any more It's Kel Kel Keller? Yeah. I know that is not K-E-H-L-E-R. K-E-H-L-E-R. Because after she passed, he contacted me and said, well, I'm contacting the sheriffs. And I want to know when she was in the hospital and how long. And he wanted dates and stuff. And I was like, okay, whatever. If you find it, I, I have. I know I have it. I thought I had it in my phone. Um, but him and the, we had a dinner afterward because um, she didn't want a funeral. She had mm -hmm. strict instructions. Um, so we had a dinner, and all of us know each other but haven't really seen or talked to each other in years since she was lit on the lake. And, you know, we didn't, none of us are really close because we didn't really but I know all those people. But they were all at the She's dinner. kind of the hub and, and yeah. you're all spokes of it. Yeah. We didn't, none of us really knew each other together, you know. So did Jim go to the dinner? He, he did. Him and his girlfriend went, um, yeah. Kareen and her husband and Kareen's brother, Anthony, came. And she was pretty close with Kareen's brother. Yeah. Okay. He, was he there at all? Yeah. He wasn't going to come. No, no. Oh, no, at the end. He saw her maybe a month before, I think. So basically it's just you there. The only person she's seen is you. Yeah. Me okay. and the neighbor. And the neighbor once in a while, but mostly yeah. it's just you. Yeah. All right. Let me grab your card. Do you have any questions? I mean, no. Once we hear from the IB, I'll let you know what's going on. Um, but do, do you know out of curiosity? They have up to a year. And it, it, they almost. I mean, it's it's not like you know it, it doesn't do anything. It's more so I just wish I knew. You know, it's more so to know if I could have done something had I been there. That's the hardest part. We, we yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know if it's a suicide, but I'd still like to know what what led up to 
her being sick for the last five years yeah. of her life. Yeah. Why? Medical problems. If it was in her head? I'll ask the doc when it comes time. Yeah. Um, but again, our medical exam, they, she'll, she may take up to a year on something. She does it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, they're very thrilled. Well, and that's, I'd rather at least, like, I was excited when they said, you know, I'm not excited, but when they said, you know, that they found something with their heart, they found, like, five different things. And that, at least, was encouraging because I went... A lot of times there's a lot of contributing factors. factors. Yeah. And it's a combination of these things. And that's what... The body starts to shut down. So, let me go grab your car. Sure. Detective, is that essentially where this interview ends? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> During that interview, do you recall the discussion about a bracelet? Yes. Did you follow up on that specific item in this case? Yes. Do you know what happened to it? It was sold to Robert Hack. What is Robert Hack? It's a diamond... Uh, Gold a place in uh, Greenfield, okay. Wisconsin by Southridge. Did you actually go there? Yes. Did you get records as well? Yes. Did they indicate who sold that item? It was Jesse. In terms of the throughout the interview, um, would it be fair to say there were some things like phone numbers or names that that people couldn't remember in the interview? Yes. Um, I'd like to show just the witness, States Exhibit 59. Um, detective, at the end of the interview, did you, were you able to give Ms. Krzyzewski a card with your info on it? Yes. Would that have included your email address? Yes. Ultimately, did Ms. Krzyzewski email you to clarify some of that information after this interview? Yes. And um, do you recognize Exhibit 59? Yes. What does it appear to be? It's, it's an email that Jesse had sent me. Okay. Um, what's the email address that this was sent from? It's J E S S R O S E S K I at gmail.com. In terms of what the defendant told you she would send you in the interview, is the content of this exhibit consistent with that? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like you to please read the, the third largest paragraph just quietly to yourself and, and let me know when you've finished. finished. In March of 2019, did Ms. Krzyzewski ever tell you that Ms. Hernan had been trying to kill herself all the time? No. In fact, in this correspondence, does the defendant indicate she finds it hard to believe suicide? That's exactly what she says in the email. Does this look like a fair and accurate copy of the email in this case? Yes. I'd move Exhibit 59 into evidence. I'm not asking to publish it. Exhibit 59 is received. Now, Detective, at a point in time, did you try to locate a, a lockbox at a BMO Harris branch? Yes. And why? There was a lockbox in Wynn's name at the BMO Harris in Waukesha. Okay. 
Did you eventually go to that location? Yes. Were you able to get inside the lockbox? Yes. What was in there? There was a small white stone um, that appeared to be like a diamond, but I didn't think it was a diamond. Okay. Any paperwork or currency? No. I'd like to show the witness States Exhibit 133, slides 10, 11, and 12, please. No objection. You said 113? 133. I'm sorry, Exhibit 133. And I, at this point, I would just be moving into evidence exhibit the last three slides, 10, 11, and 12. And that's what there's no objection to? Correct. All right, Exhibit 133, slides 10, 11, and 12 are received. I'd ask to publish these, Madam Clerk. And Detective, do you see the image before you? Yes. On States 133, slide 10, what is the jury looking at here? This is the exterior of the lockbox that okay. belonged to, or what, that was in the Bimo Harris that was registered to Lynn Hernan. Okay. Moving to slide 11, what can we see here? This is the photo of the box after we opened it. Okay. And what about slide 10? I'm sorry, 12. <clears throat> That's that white stone that was in the box. Okay. That's all I have, thank you. All right, prior to uh, cross, I'm going to uh, excuse the jurors and we'll let you know when you can come on back in. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. Be seated. Anyone have the uh, document number for the state's letter outlining the redactions? I can pull that up. Um, or the date you think it was sent. located the email which was sent January 19th of 2023 to both attorneys Galavis and Kukler. Attached is the letter dated January 19th, 2023 with all of the redactions. I also sent this again on October 10th of 2023. Was this filed with the court ever? I don't believe it was ever filed with the court. Attorney Galavis, any objection if the state emails that to the court so that I can review that since that's apparently what we're going to discuss, Detective? You can step down for now. No, Judge, it's fine. All right. That explains why I couldn't find that. I just sent it to your clerk. I think there may have been a reference to it and then a letter to the court either late summer, early fall, around the time of our jury status. Right. But I don't know that the letter was ever. I think it included a reference to it in the outstanding issues that were provided to the court. No, just send it, uh, please send it to me. Attorney Nikolai, while I'm waiting for that to be printed, the redactions that you made, do you believe those to be consistent with the court's rulings on motions in limine in this case? Yes. 
and are those why those were made? I would also note, I believe that they're consistent with the court's ruling on other acts motions and even goes a step further in preventing the jury from hearing things about Ms. Kraszewski's prior criminal convictions or criminal conduct, even if those are allowed into evidence. So even though the defense never actually wrote any motion for this court to consider about how to, for instance, explain that she appears in custody during interviews or explain that there was a revocation hearing in this case or explain that there are two witnesses who only know her from a custodial setting. Um, I have done what I believe to be appropriate and admissible in terms of deleting every reference of the defendant being a felon, the defendant being on a probation hold, the defendant uh, being revoked from a probation hold, the defendant having been in prison or going to prison. Um, and of the probably 12 hours of interviews in this case, I believe that not only myself, but two other individuals now have listened to them at least four times to make sure that the clips we have accomplished all of those goals. Um, so I believe at this point the state's gone above and beyond given the lack of any guidance offered by the defense despite my numerous requests um, to talk about that. I think that the response this court was given from defense at one point was just that none of that should come in. So I didn't know what that meant because we obviously have evidence that she's in custody during some of these interviews coming in. Um, so that's not been addressed, but I did try to strike that from the record the best I could in terms of things she's saying during these interviews. Which I is why I took exception and issue to the way the defense characterized the way I was trying with this witness to explain to the jury why these things are clipped out. Because the suggestion was made that Detective Pohl and I are trying to hide things when in reality it was because his own client talks about either her prior criminal history or the victim's prior criminal history. And I certainly don't want that to continue occurring. I recall there was a hearing and it might have been the jury status in January of this year prior to the uh, trial being adjourned that we had scheduled for February where there was a comment made during our many discussions about, well, none of that's coming in in any event from Attorney Galavis. I'll, I'll keep looking for that so I can find um, that. I think it, I'm finding it. I have a, a note to it. Um, was at the January 26, 2023 jury status hearing. Um, Attorney Gallup has indicated there were no issues with in custody status during interviews, but they made a blanket objection to mention of any pins for telephone use, any jailhouse phone calls, any mention of being in prison during probate matter, um, and then you ordered them to file something, which was never done. Right, there's some notes about my recollection, uh, of course, of that hearing. Um, Attorney Galloway is saying they need to stay on point. We understand videos of her being in custody at times are unavoidable. Um, there's that discussion about PIN numbers, etc. reference to all of this being turned over to the defense in relation to phone calls, jail phone calls, PIN numbers, etc. cetera. Um, in any event, I know we discussed that and all these related issues at that prior jury status, and it's true I don't have any particular motion. 
I believe I also advised the parties I was thinking about a cautionary instruction and asked the defense if they wanted one themselves to send something. I haven't gotten anything. Um, so uh, Attorney Galavis, uh, we should have addressed this long ago. I'm not sure that any of this is timely, um, but I don't, I don't even know what your request is. Well, again, Judge, as far as a lot of the stuff on, that's been redacted, we have no objection to like 95% of it. Anything that discusses revocation hearings, Lynn being in prison or Jesse being in prison or Jesse being revoked or Jesse talking to a probation agent, which is most of this that they've redacted, like 95% of it. In relationship to the March 6, 2019 interview, between 26.09 and 26.40, where they're requesting a redaction. And I'm okay redacting the first part of that area where they marked 21.54 to Which clip are we talking about? To March 6, 2019. No, I understand that. Which clip? We just watched, I think, five or six clips from that. Which clip are you talking about? Well, they didn't show the clip. They redacted. What is it? Which clips does it fall between? I'm guessing it's between the... Second, first and second. And what's the time period? The they time stamp? Did they wish redacted? No, that you wished. I, guessing that you wished to have played. Just 26.09 between and 26.40. In regards so to. So 1026. I'm just reading the police report. I'm just reading the, the letter from the state. I can shed some light on this, Judge. The, there's always two different players for timestamps on these on these recordings, and one of them runs along with the player, which is how this redaction list was created. However, once we start putting clips into a PowerPoint, you can't count on that anymore because it starts at zero every time. So we had to translate all of our times in our exhibits to the timestamp that can be seen in the video with the actual time of the day on it as it runs and so that's what's listed in all of our exhibits right. so that do you know are you able to tell me what 26 so, nine through 26 40 what time that would be as yes. in, in relation would, to what we just watched right it would let me um Between 10, 10.24 and 10.28, roughly. Between All right, thank you. Between four and five. Between four and five, okay. And the content is an admissible information based on this court's rulings and the motions in limine. It taught, it's the defendant claiming the victim was abusing narcotics, marijuana, pills, everything. Attorney Galavis, do you agree that that's the sum and substance of that yeah. clip? Yeah, it discusses uh, Lynn using narcotics, was a drinker, like pills, and like weed. And like weed. Well, that would violate my prior rulings in the motions in limine, specifically number 19 of state's motion in limine, document 119, that I've addressed. This would be the second time now that I'm addressing. So I expect everyone to follow the rulings I made in the motions in limine, and I'm not going to be having these hearings in the middle of trial, wasting the jury's time on issues that I've already ruled on. And since we're outside the presence of the jury, if there are questions that violate this, I've been kind right now, and I have not had to uh, give any admonitions in front of the jury. But I'm giving a warning to the defense that if you ask questions that violate my rulings, you run the risk of this court uh, giving an admonition in front of the jury and advising them that you're asking your question violates a motion in limine ruling made previously by this court. And if there are questions 
or insinuations uh, about evidence and why it's redacted. We don't tell juries why things are redacted. Um, and I understand why Attorney Nikolai uh, asked the questions that she did, but if, if there's a request, meaning if there's a violation going forward, and if there's a request from the state that I explain to the jury what's going on, I may very well do that. Um, so I'm, unless you tell me there's something I'm missing here, that this is inadmissible evidence based upon my prior ruling, I'm not going to readdress it. Well, Judge, again, this is the reason I'm bringing it up before the witness testifies, because I don't want to bring it up while he's testifying. You should have to bring it up. I've already ruled on it, and your questions on cross should be accordingly. Right. But under due process, a defendant has a right to present a defense. And uh, what, what other acts motion have you filed that would even give the defense grounds for me to address this, other than what I already have? These are clearly other acts of the victim. And the statute, what is it, 90404, applies. There's no motion. There was no motion at any point in time. There was the state filing a motion to limit it. Other than that, no motion from the defense. So any request that you have is untimely. And I'm not revisiting the motions in limine. So we're going to bring the jury back out. Detective Cole is going to come back out on the stand. And you can do your cross, and it needs to be in line with my rulings. Understood? Yes, Judge. Can I use the bathroom for two minutes? Yes, you may use the restroom for two minutes, and then we'll come back. All right, thank you. We have Attorney Galavis back. Go ahead, Madam Clerk, and have the jury brought back out.
right, thank you everyone. Please be seated. Oh, great, Detective Cole, you back up here. Thank you, have a seat. And Attorney Galavis, will you be doing the cross? Yes, Judge, thank you. All right, when you're ready then, thank you. Mr. Cole. So as far as your law enforcement experience, you said you were a deputy with the Sheriff's Department, correct? I was a detective. So you were hired straight to be a detective? No, I started, was hired originally as a correction officer. So you went from correctional officer then to deputy? Yes. When did you become a deputy? 1999. And then from there you became a detective? In 2001. And this was all with the Waukesha Sheriff's Department? Yes. And you eventually left the Sheriff's Department and you're an officer, correct? Yes, I retired in May. Of 2023? Yes. And now you're an officer for what municipality? Houston's Ferd PD. And as a law enforcement officer for the Sheriff's Department, what kind of uh, investigations did you partake in? A variety of investigations, including narcotics, uh, property crime, death investigation, auto theft. So you did narcotics investigations? So you, were you working for a special unit? I have. And what unit was that? I worked for the Waukesha County Metro Drug. And how long did you work there? I had three tours, um, just under 15 years. Is it safe to say you had a lot of experience with uh, drug, um, like prescription drug investigations? Yes. Approximately how many cases did you investigate involving, involving prescription drugs? Dozens. I'm sorry, I can't give you an accident, uh, an accurate representation. I just, a dozens, I would say. In what years did that take place where you investigated prescription drug investigations? Um, prescription drugs probably came around in uh, the late 2000s uh, until I retired. Sir, so in 2018, you were investigating prescription drug scenes and things like that? I was, at that time, I was assigned a, a detective bureau in general investigation. So I was doing all types of investigations, including uh, drug overdoses or death investigations. Did you do any investigations with the at the federal level? Yes. And did they involve like, drugs? They involved drugs, yes. How many federal cases did you handle? Um, I was involved in dozens of federal investigations. Did those involve prescription drugs too? Uh, mostly um, street level narcotics. When did you, again, get involved in this case? In January of 2019. And that's when the ME, a medical examiner, contacted you? Correct. Do you know who from the medical examiner contacted you? Um, ultimately, it was Dr. B, um, but one of her staff called me. So when this incident, there's been testimony that this incident occurred on October 3rd, 2018. You're aware of that? Yes. And from 2000, 
October 3rd, 2018 until January, you were not involved in, in this case at all? No. When the ME contacted you, did you get caught up to speed regarding the investigation? Um, I guess we started an investigation. I contacted my supervisor and advised what the medical examiner had um, briefed me on, and an investigation was reopened. So October 3rd, 2018, this incident happens, and then the case gets closed, correct? I, I, I can't honestly say if it was closed because I don't manage the case, um, case operations, but I would say that's probably accurate, that it was not an active investigation. It's probably a, an accurate assessment. And do you remember uh, writing a report where, you, where your report says you reopened the case? Yes. Yourself? And that was in January 2019. I don't recall when I wrote the supplement. If I showed you a copy of the supplement, would it refresh your memory? Yes. Judge, my approach to the witness. Sure, just show the state first. Thank you. You're welcome. Marked any exhibits today that should be marked as for identification purposes as 590. 592? Okay, thank you. 593. It'll be marked as exhibit 593 for ID purposes. Mr. Cole, does that appear to be a, your, a supplement that you, you were involved in? Yes. In fact, it has your heading on it, correct? Your name? Yes. And it's uh, supplement number 27? If you say so. And it states reopen case, Detective Chris Cole. Is yes. that correct? It has a date of January 2019, correct? I think it had a, delay, a date of July of 19, did it not? Well, I can show you again if you're. If you're okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. shows that it was generated on July 18, 2019. Yeah, what's the next paragraph? It says in January of 2019. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And during this time, an individual who was identified as John Fry had contacted the medical examiner's office, correct? Yes. And that was in January 2019, correct? I believe it was, it was after her death, he was contacting the medical examiner's office. And John Fry, uh, you, you were aware, was the district Objection attorney? Objection relevance sustained. And you were aware that a person named James Kelleher had contacted the medical examiner? Two also in 2019, January? I know he contacted the medical examiner's office, yes. And as a result of that, did they contact them, do you know, before the ME contacted you or after the ME contacted you? I don't know. So if I was to tell you they contacted the ME before they contacted you, you wouldn't argue with that? I, I would I know that they had both contacted the medical examiner's office prior to contacting me. And as a result of that, the ME, your case was reopened, correct? As a result of the medical examiner contacting me, yes. And you indicated that at that time you had to get up to speed regarding the investigation, correct? Yeah, I'd never seen it before. So what did you do to get up to speed? I reviewed the original uh, report taken the day of the death. And that's it? That's what I started with, sir. 
Right. What else did you do to get up to speed? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me, sir. Well, you had never been on this case until January 2019, correct? Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And then the medical examiner contacts you, which causes you to reopen your case, correct? Yes. So you're going to be on the science of the case, correct? I was one of the detectives, yes. You were one of the lead detectives on the case, correct? At the beginning, yes. And that was in January 2019, correct? Yes. So what did you need to do to get you updated? I started looking at the parties involved. I know you indicated that you looked at police reports, correct? Yes. Did you look at the Pewaukee Fire Department police reports regarding their response and what reports they generated? At some point during the investigation, yes. Did you look at witness statements that were on the scene that were taken on the scene? Yes. Do you recall anything else you did? Did you look at photographs? Yes. And those were photographs taken on the scene? Yes. Had, did you, when was it that you began, did you begin, did you ever question witnesses in January 12, 19? In January of 19? I don't recall when I started talking to witnesses. Well, you interviewed uh, Ms. Kerchewski, was it March 6th of 2019? Yes. And in that video, that's her mom, Jennifer Flower? Yes. So between January and before you questioned her, what additional stuff do you review? Objection vague. Um, overruled, he may answer. I don't recall. This was five years ago, and at the time when the medical examiner contacted me, um, referenced the substance found in Ms. Hernan, um, it was still unclear um, how uh, that, that substance may have gotten in there, and she was still researching on how it may have been ingested in the body. So basic investigation had started. But as far as um, when or who I talked to at the time, I just, I, I can't tell you. I just don't recall. I understand that. Did, prior to testifying today, did you review your testimony with the prosecutors? We had a meeting, yes. And did you review your testimony with the prosecutors before you? Object. Uh, sustained us to the form of the question. Well, you met with the prosecutors before testifying today, correct? Yes. When did you meet with them? Approximately two weeks ago. And what was the purpose of your meeting? To discuss my testimony. And they, did they show you this, the video that they just played? Uh, they showed me the video, we yes, the one we just saw. Did you review the whole video? The original video with the videos that video the videos that they showed you. I reviewed the original video. And in that video, where Miss Krzyzewski's talking with you, she doesn't believe this was a suicide, correct? I don't think she ever says that in the video. But she's kind of questioning whether or not this was a suicide involving Lynn Hernan, correct? I, I guess that's my impression, yes. And she's asking you that she wants you to do more investigation because she doesn't believe this is a suicide, correct? She's pushing it. She wants to know how she died. And she's adamant about that, right? You, I want you to do more investigation. I don't believe this is a suicide, correct? Objection. I don't think she says she wants to do more investigation. Been an objection. <laughs> the um, sustained as to the form of the question. You can rephrase. Well, in that email that she sent you on that same day, she tells you that in the email it kind of states a heart. It says a heart, hard to believe a suicide. Correct? In the email she states she doesn't believe it's a suicide, yes. 
And she wants you or your department to do more investigation, correct? I'd have to look at the email again, but I don't think she said that in the email. Well, how, the email stamped like 12.06 p.m. on that same day, correct? It's around there, I believe, yes. And you had interviewed her at what time? It was, I believe, started at 10 a.m. So shortly after she leaves your office, she sends you an email, correct? Yes. And was there any else thing, anything else to attach to that email? Any other documents that you sent? I believe there were attachments. What, were, what was attached to the email? I don't recall it specifically. showed you a document, would it refresh your memory as whether or not this was attached to the email? Uh, it may. document to Madam Clerk, please, and I'll take a look at it without argument by either party. The email the state showed, is that a full, can you put that up just for my review? And then if it's more than one page, that's all I need to know. Okay. Let me see the parties at sidebar. was an objection. I sustain the objection. Next question, please. Mr. Cole. 
think at the beginning of your testimony, the jury heard a recorded telephone call that your office received from Jesse Krzyzewski? The dispatch center received it. And did the dispatch center also record the 911 call that was made by Jesse on October 3rd, 2019? I believe they would have. And did you listen, listen to that? I'm guessing at some point I did. Did you provide a copy of the, that call, 911 call to the prosecutors? I don't recall. So you clearly remember listening to a 911 call? Or I, the 911 call? I didn't case. testify to that. I said I probably, I, I would have listened to it if we, I, I don't recall listening to it. I, I tend to think I would have listened to it, but I don't specifically recall listening to it. So as you sit there today, you may have listened to it or may have not listened to it. I just don't remember. It's been five years. And again, from October 3rd, 2018, to when you got on the case, your office was treating this as a suicide, correct? I I don't know how they were treating it. I wasn't involved until January of 19. So why did you have to reopen the case? I reopened the case because my boss told me to reopen the case. Um, and we started an active death investigation. And you were involved, did you ever interview that uh, neighbor that lived next to Ben Hernan? I don't believe I did. But you know your office did, correct? I believe someone did, yes. And her, her name was identified as Jean Tunnell, correct? Yes. And you got that information from Jesse during the inter interview, correct? Yes. And. Did, did, uh, to your knowledge, Lynn Tunnell confirm what Jesse had told you regarding Lynn? Objection. Calls for hearsay. Sus Motion strike. Sustained. Well, Jesse had mentioned that the neighbor came over and helped her pick up Lynn several times before her death, correct? She did state that, yes. So did you confirm that? Anybody in your office confirm that with the neighbor? Objection. Calls for hearsay. Uh, overruled, the way it was asked. I believe... She, someone in my office interviewed her. You'd have to ask that detective. Did you personally interview any other any other individuals? Yes. Who did you interview? In its entirety of the case. Right, as far as citizen citizen witnesses. <sighs> to the best of my recollection, I. Um, Interview John Fryatt, um, Jim Kellner, um, there was a, uh, um, trying to think of her name, there was a bartender in West Dallas I, I interviewed, I can't remember her name, I also met a gentleman, um, um, in West Dallas and interviewed him too, but I don't recall his name either. Would that be, if I told you Scott Craig, would you object with that? I don't think I ever interviewed Scott Craig, but I had talked to him. Do you interview an individual by, by the name of uh, Autumn Rogers? Autumn Rogers, did you say? Yes.
Eventually, you got off this case, correct? Yes. And you got off the case when you retired? Um, I was transferred divisions. So when did you get transferred and taken off the case? I don't know the exact date. What well, approximate month of the year? I I don't know. It was after it was after J July of nineteen. Um, I was transferred several times to specialty units, so I the exact dates I don't recall. But you did uh, make additional contacts with Jesse during your investigation, correct? I interviewed her several times. Right. You interviewed her on July 9, 2019, correct? Yes. July 10, 2019, correct? Around there, I believe, yes. And July 11, 2019, correct? Sounds about right. And uh, during those interviews that you had with Jesse, you opined to her that you thought this was a suicide. Is that correct? I may have. When you interviewed her in July, had you examined the NS NMS report from the lab? Uh, can you re ask that question again, please? When you interviewed her in July, had you reviewed the NMS report from the lab as far as the test results? Is that the toxicology report you're referring to? Correct. Um, I don't recall if we had that back. Uh, I don't recall if I did or not. Uh, Counselor, I, I don't want to sound evasive, but since I retired, I don't have access to the case files. So during, I was only trial prepped on certain things that I, I didn't have access to any of the other, other stuff, like the interview um, of Jesse. So I, I, I remember vaguely, I remember interviewing her, but if you ask me specifics on that, I, I just, I can't actually, I haven't reviewed it in five years or four years. But you were involved in those interviews, correct? Yes. You were, in fact, most of the time in charge of the interviews in July of 2019, correct? I would say I was a co-lead with Detective Hoppy. Is it safe to say prior to your involvement in this case, you had no knowledge about Visine, correct? That is true. Is it safe to say you had no knowledge at all that the Visine was even lethal, correct? Uh, that is true. <clears throat> it's safe to say you had no strike that. Did you do any research yourself regarding Visine? No. Well, how did you become familiar with it when you were involved in this case? Dr. B, she did the, the research and, it, and, and briefed us. So when you learned about Visine being lethal, you just learned it from other people? Yes. You were just being told what Visine could do or not do, correct? By Dr. B, yes. You had personally had no knowledge of it, correct? Correct. Nor did you do any research regarding it, correct? Correct. So because of this memory, you probably weren't aware that Lynn Hearn, Hearn had a prescription drug. Objection. Move to strike. I don't know what the full question was going to be. So understanding my previous rulings, you may ask the question again. Well, well you looked at the NSM report, right? 
from the lab? I believe I did. And it listed a bunch of prescription drugs in Lynn Hernan's system, correct? I believe there were several substances in her system. And one of those prescription drugs that was listed was baclofen, correct? I don't recall. And another drug that was listed was cyclobenzaprine, correct? I don't recall. And another drug that was listed was nifedipine, correct? I don't recall. Do you recall those drugs or that report when you questioned Jesse in July of 2019? I don't recall. Did you ever ask Jesse in those interviews about baclofen? I'm pretty sure I did not. Did you ask her anything about cyclobenzaprine? I would say no. Or nifedipine? No. When you, if I could show you the report, would it refresh your memory? It may. July. I think it's August 8th, exhibit number. Fair enough. A report from the summer of 2019. Correct. You'll still have 594 if you want to mark it for identification because that other exhibit was not marked. I think it was exhibit number 25. Twenty-five was a photo. Exhibit number thirty-five. Can I? Correct. Would like to bring it up uh, on the sure. screen so we can. Go ahead. It's it's up. I, I can. I think Attorney Galabies is looked up. Just a minute, please. Sure. Be on the screen now. I got it. Do you want it in front of the witness? Yes, Judge. Thank you. Should take a moment. It's in front of the witness. Mr. Paul, I'm showing you what's marked as state exhibit number 35. Can, do you see it on your screen yet? Um, I see the partial of the document. Counter and I'll say one of 14 right now. Do you see that? Far right. Far right. Middle of the screen. I see it, one of 14, yes. All right. Go ahead. Do you see at the bottom of that first page, it states exhibit number 35? Yep. And uh, the, the title of that first page is, do you see what's titled NMS? Yes. Perhaps? And it's dated August 7, 2019? Yes. Had you seen the first report that came out regarding this case before you interviewed Jesse in July of 2019? I don't recall. Had you looked at any NMS reports prior to interviewing Jesse? I don't recall. But in your interviews in July, you would refer to the tetrahydrazoline level in the NMS end report.
to? Can you restate the question? I didn't, I didn't hear it fully. Well, in your July interviews of Jesse of 2019, you would refer to the test levels or test level result for tetrahydrazoline. I may have. So me, me telling you that doesn't refresh your memory? Again, I didn't review the interviews with Jesse prior to the hearing today. So I, I just don't recall what I said and what I didn't say four years ago. So you don't recall telling Jesse that the 60 NG was fatal on tetrahydrazoline? I may have said that. It's a safe to say you would know how much visine it would take to get to any THC level? I would not know how to rely on Dr. B. So any information that you had was just by talking to Dr. B? Yes. And when you mentioned Dr. B, her name is listed on the report, exhibit number 35, correct? It is. And Dr. B is Dr. Linda Brzezicki? Correct. And do you recall, if you can, that throughout those interviews in July of 2019 with Jesse, she always told you that she did. Objection and calls for hearsay. Sustained. State versus Johnson. Well, in the March 6, 2019 interview, and in the email, Jesse. Or you opined that it was a suicide, correct? Well, Jesse emailed me, so um, I, I, at the time, we didn't know. Um, uh, I, I may have said that it, we were investigating what we thought originally was a suicide. And while you were one of the lead investigators on this, on this case, did anyone from your department interview the, I should, I'm going to restate the question. Well, you know that checks were involved in this case, correct? There's a financial aspect, yes. That eventually this investigation turned into a financial fraud investigation, correct? Yes. And were you still on the case when that was being done? Yes. And so you were aware that uh, there were checks retrieved or copies of checks retrieved from the BMO Harris Bank, correct? There were checks received from financial institutions, but oh, I wasn't involved in the financial portion of the investigation. So as far as you were concerned, you handled none of the financial stuff? No. Do you recall whether or not you heard testimony or through your investigation that no one from your department ever located any eye drops at the scene, correct? I don't believe any eye drops were located at the scene. And it's safe to say no one was looking for eye drops at the scene, correct? Um, I would say that's probably accurate, yes. So it's safe to say that because you weren't looking for eye drops at the scene, there could have been eye drops there at the scene, correct? I wasn't at the scene, so I don't know. Well, you saw photographs of the scene, correct? I did. And you talked to some of the deputies that responded to the scene, correct? I spoke to deputies, yes. And uh, were you informed that no one 
there at the scene look for eye drops, correct? No one mentioned seeing eye drops. Well, did you ask any of the deputies or anybody, did you guys look for eye drops? I probably asked them if they saw any eye drops and no one saw any. Well, that's because everyone at the scene thought it was a suicide, correct? I don't know what they thought. You'd have to ask them. Did, uh, you said you had interviewed an individual by the name of John Fry, correct? Yes. Did you, were you able to determine his relationship to Lynn Hernan? I believe he was a cousin. <clears throat> Did you able to determine whether or not, whether or not he was close to her? Um, I got the, imp I don't think they were real close. Judge, you have no further questions. Any redirect? Just briefly, Judge. <clears throat> Detective, you were asked some questions about meeting with our office. Do you remember those? Yes. And was that the first time you'd ever met with our office before a trial you were involved in? No, that's pretty standard. Okay. When we had this meeting with you, um, did any of the attorneys at this table tell you what we wanted you to say? No. Are there things that as you sit here today, you just simply don't remember from the investigation in this case? There's a lot. Okay. For example, as you sit here today, do you know whether there exists a 911 call from the date of the death? I don't. Okay. Generally, would you say that on your cases, if that type of audio is available, that you would listen to it? Yes. Okay. You were asked some questions about, I believe Attorney Gallup has phrased it, being taken off of this case. Do you remember that? Yes. Why Why did you stop working on the case? I was transferred. Okay. To what kind of unit? Do you remember? Back to the Metro Drug Unit. Okay. And those interviews that you were asked about from July of 2019, was Detective Hoppy in each and every one of those? Yes. Okay. In fact, are you aware that he spoke with the defendant more times than you did? Yes. Okay. And I didn't ask you to review all those before today, right? No. If you wanted to, could you have gotten them on your own? I would have had to ask the department for them. Okay. So you can't remotely access even your own files from when you worked here? No. Okay. Is it pretty standard that through the department... Um, People are moved and reassigned to different units fairly frequently? Detectives can be. Okay. Was that true for you? I, I spent a lot of time in specialty units. Okay. Was that in any way some form of discipline? No. Okay. Is that, are those specialty units sought after in your department? Yes. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Detective, you may, excuse me, Officer Cole, you may step down. Thank you. Just the state's uh, subpoena? Yes. All right. He may be released then. Thank you. All right. It is 1033. This will be an excellent time for our mid-morning break. Um, I'll let the bailiffs know probably about 15, 20 minutes, but all rise for the jury, please.
Thank you. Be seated. I do have to place on the record the one sidebar. Um, it had to do with what was ultimately not marked as an exhibit, even for identification purposes. Uh, they were printed documents, and the objection from the state was that they're not the same thing. And when I reviewed the email on Attorney Nikolai's computer, what is attached to that email are photographs of documents, not the documents themselves. Uh, in fact, some of them are difficult to read given how they were photographed. And so I sustained the objection because what Attorney Galavis had, while appearing to be the documents that may very well have been attached, are not the same thing as what was included. And so therefore I sustained the objection. I think that was the only sidebar we had. Um, I'll give you all your break. And then I believe the next witness I'll need to address the state's motion. I believe so. All right, so the defense should be prepared to discuss that after uh, the break. All right. Do you have a document number on that filing? I thought it was 593, but it says 592 on it. Did I make a mistake? I have 593. Is, are we talking about the email? I'm sorry, I was referring to the motion that was filed by the state. Okay, I thought I may have missed my report, Teresa. Okay, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. I had it written down 593, but maybe I'm wrong. All right, well, we'll look at all of that during the break. If we need to make a correction in front of the jury, we will. I don't have the document number ahead of me, but Teresa can give you that off the record. Okay. All right, we're in recess, everyone. Um, why don't you come back in about 15 minutes? Okay.
All right, we are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before. I think Attorney Sisberger might be in the hallway, but I do want to address this motion from the state uh, dealing with dual subpoenas. Obviously, we had some witnesses at the end of the day on Friday uh, that were subject to dual subpoenas and they were not released. Um, I've read through the motion. Um, Attorney Nikolai, anything else you want to state as it relates to that or put on the record? No, it's really all contained in the filing. All right. What's the defense position? Judge, uh, we object to um, you granting that particular motion. I don't think it's our responsibility to provide an offer of proof when the state wants to release a witness. They're under our subpoena. We have the right to present our case and our defense at the time that, that the case turns to us. It's it would be very difficult for us at this moment to say exactly, um, well, I don't think we're required to give what, what other testimony may we might want to elicit. Uh, the only person I can think of that falls in that category was Kareem Poza, but maybe there was someone else. James Kelleher was not released from his oh, either. Oh, James Kelleher. I mean, there's, we had both of those witnesses under subpoena. We plan to elicit certain information. In respect to uh, Ms. Poza's, I know that there was something that was not uh, brought into the trial that we will want to introduce. So, I mean, we have the right to present our case. The state doesn't have to provide uh, some kind of um, offer of proof every time they present a witness. I don't think an offer of proof is needed, but I spent some time thinking about this as well. I think under 90611, I have clear authority to uh, address when there are dual subpoenas. Um, while I don't believe an offer of proof is perhaps the right mechanism, um, I want to be mindful of the time for these witnesses as well. This isn't your typical two, three day trial where it really wouldn't be an inconvenience or a hardship. Um, this is a multi week trial uh, where the state has indicated their case in chief will take eight to nine days of testimony. So that puts us into, you know, late this week, early next week for when they will uh, wrap up their case. Under 90611, um, what I would like to see going forward is that um, the defense, if there is going to be an objection to releasing an individual from a subpoena, that you provide a strategic reason as to why this witness uh, cannot be fully examined on cross-examination. I mean, on the one hand, if you do this when the state calls the witness, you have the ability to cross-examine and ask leading questions, which you won't otherwise have. You'll have to um, ask non-leading questions when you call this witness during uh, your case in chief. Um, so I also thought about, well, if we get done with direct, cross, and redirect, I could say, all right, uh, under 90611, please consider this your witness and ask your questions and require you to ask your questions at that point in time while they're still here. Uh, again, absent a, uh, a strategic reason, um, I want to go forward in this fashion. Obviously, we have the two witnesses who already have testified and they remain under subpoena and they'll be subject to my prior orders uh, for exclusion of witnesses. Um, but going forward, and we'll do this of course outside the presence of the jury, I will just need to be alerted to um, who these witnesses are so that we can do them outside the presence of the jury. I believe the next witness is subject to a dual Subpoena was that Mr. Craig? I would actually ask the defense be required to give us that list because it's very unclear every time you ask I, I'm just relying on what our witnesses have indicated in terms of whether they've received a subpoena or not, but um, 
there seems to be some confusion every time that that question comes up. I think it'd be helpful if we had a list of the people that are under a defense subpoena as opposed to well, I haven't required the state to provide a list of who you're going to call every day, and I'm not going to micromanage them. Now, if you guys want to alter that, and that's what the state does, so we can, but I'm trying to balance what you all have asked me to do, um, and, um, and I've required the parties to meet and confer, so unless you want to change that procedure, I'm not going to require them to do that. Judge, it, frankly, it just appears that the state's being held to a different standard. Every day we're answering questions about how many people and who's next and what the order is that we're not required to do. Obviously, we're getting absolutely no information about, for example, why Mr. Kelleher can't be in the courtroom. He's been at every hearing in this case because although he's not a statutory victim, he feels like a victim and was very close to the victim. And I just, I, he would love to be here. Right, but there's this kind of unsaid reason that he needs to be recalled, and I don't, I don't really think that that's fair. I understand that, and uh, I'm changing the rules midstream here, and unfortunately, Mr. Kelleher and Ms. Poza fall under the old way. Uh, but as it relates to, uh, I'm not putting the state to a different standard. Under 906.11, I think it makes sense, uh, and I think there's a due process component as well um, for the state to, at the end of each day, give the defense, or whatever point in time during the day you want to do it, um, a heads up on who you believe the next witnesses will be. I'm asking you to do it on a day-by-day -day basis. I'm not asking you to map out everything in advance. Um, it's to... Uh, hopefully help the defense in a way be prepared for, you know, what's coming up next. Um, but in the same way, I do think it's reasonable that uh, the defense provide a definitive answer as to whether someone's currently under subpoena. Just being on a witness list is not sufficient. They have to have been served appropriately with a subpoena. So this next witness, Mr. Craig, has the defense subpoenaed this individual and served it appropriately under the statute? So for clarification purposes, Your Honor, then does that mean going forward the defense is now going to be allowed recross with every witness? Because no, that's this, you will be allowed recross if they are under subpoena. The whole point I shouldn't have to give you all a lesson on what is direct, what is proper cross, and what is proper redirect. I don't typically allow recross unless somehow there's been an opening of the door. And it won't be recross that I'm allowing you. It will be if they're under your subpoena, you will then commence your direct examination. So you have two options. The one is during your full opportunity to cross, you can ask all of those questions and take advantage of those witnesses being, you can lead those witnesses should you choose. Um, well, I guess my comment on that, Your Honor, would be that that is unfair to make us do our direct examination of defense witnesses during the midst of the state's case. We should be able to present our case in the order we want at the time that is allotted to us. We need to be mindful of these witnesses I, as well. I do well. appreciate that. And so this next witness, is he under subpoena from the defense? Yes. And he's been served? Yes. All right. So you're, is your honor saying that we cannot call him in our case? You're not going to allow us? No, I'd like to be able to release witnesses. If you choose to recall them, I guess that's fine. What I'm saying is I'm giving you a choice. You can... If you, if I'm not going to allow recross, but if you'd like to start with direct and then it goes to cross and then you will end with redirect, that will be the procedure that we follow. Again, unless you can give me a, a strategic reason as to why I should have this witness come back, what, 10 days from now, nine days from now? Um, and have to come back in and testify a second time. This is really has to do with the 
being mindful of the witnesses who are here um, and their time. Some of them, yes, wanted, have been here previously. I, I put very little on that. Um, I have an exclusion order for a reason. Um, so let's talk about Mr. Craig. Do you, I'm presuming you're, I'll transition, we'll get done with redirect, and I'll say then the defense, since this witness is also under dual subpoena, you may commence your direct examination. I have authority under 90611. Witnesses are called out of order all the time um, in cases, sometimes for the convenience of the attorneys, of the parties, of the witnesses, sometimes for our jury as well. I guess my comment on that is uh, I don't want to do my direct examination of Mr. Craig today. Give me a strategic reason as to why I should continue his subpoena to a later point in time. I just don't believe I have to give a strategic reason. That's or the rule the that court. I am imposing under 90611, given the length of this trial, given uh, the courtesy to the witnesses, um, I'll give you a full and fair opportunity. That's not the issue here. Um, and the jury will be advised that they're now uh, a defense witness as well, so that it's very clear we, we can demarc demarcate that in, in any way. Uh, but just give me a strategic reason as to why. I don't want you to uh, indicate that this witness is here today for the defense. I'm not so asking for that. Your objection is noted for the record. And but also, unless you can tell me there's some additional investigation that was done by the defense that is different information that goes to the defense, my understanding is most of these witnesses right now, at least the ones that we have seen, have all been part of the investigation done by uh, the sheriff's department. This is information that has been provided from the state to the defense. And again, when you compare, Your Honor, to cases, as you indicate, this is not a, similar to a case that's a two-day or three-day trial. I agree with that. This is a trial that's scheduled to last weeks where my client's facing a life sentence. So I just think that it's unfair to, to, to manage the defense case in the manner that you're proposing. I can't say that we will or won't call Mr. Craig uh, going forward. We'll have to evaluate what was elicited during the state's case and make, make a strategic decision once the state rests. Certainly we try to ask everything that's important at the time that the witness is here. But I think we have a right to reevaluate it once the state closes their case and look to see if there are other things that, that were not brought up through deliberate or inadvertence, whatever the reason is, but we have a client facing a life sentence. And I want the opportunity once the state closes their case to reevaluate the witnesses and make that decision. I'm not saying I won't give you that opportunity because I think that's a fair assessment, but I still don't see how that should interfere with the requirement that I'm putting on the defense to do ask this witness all the questions that you have. If, if something comes up at a later point in time and you say we want to recall them, I'm not saying you're not going to have that opportunity. It's really about releasing them from subpoenas at this time um, and being mindful of their time as well. So um, I'll even let you make that decision. I was hoping I could do it ahead of time. Again, you all know your cases, I presume, very, very well. I have never read any of these reports. All I have is a, a criminal complaint and a testimony and evidence that I've heard to this point in time. Um, I'm not asking you for an offer of proof. I'm just simply saying under 90611, I want some type of strategic reason as to why this witness can't be released from the subpoenas. You can do that after all of the questions uh, have been asked. But please, please do your very best to make sure these witnesses are fully questioned. We've had a significant amount of cross-examination, sometimes more than the direct examination. Um, and so um, that is just my observation. Uh, and um, you know, most of the times, I don't think this is really an issue. Um, 
and we're just going to do this one by one. Um, if that means I have to excuse the jury and we make a record of each one, then so be it. But again, I'd like to keep us moving and I'd like to be mindful of the witnesses' um, time and uh, that this is done in an in a way that, yes, affords due process, the opportunity to be heard, the opportunity to uh, not only cross-examine witnesses, but to call uh, her own witnesses. I understand all of that, and I'm not unmindful of that. If in the meantime you find any case law that you think undermines my decision, please let me know, but I do believe under 906.11 I have the ability to control the order of interrogation of witnesses, even those that are under dual subpoena from both the state and uh, the defense. All right, with that, uh, then anything else I need to address before bringing the jury in for the next witness from the state? No. From the defense. I think I left a new uh, flash drive up for uh, Madam Clerk and one on uh, the state's desk, too. And Madam Clerk, did, we, did you confirm that, that was it was so it was properly marked it, i corrected it it was marked as 592 but then i was handed a different 592 all right so the jury is aware that it's 593 and so nothing needs to be done in front of the jury that okay very good then uh, madam clerk go ahead All right, thank you, everyone. Please be seated. All right, the statement calls next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. State calls Scott Craig. Good morning, Mr. Craig. If you would please make your way to the witness stand. It's at the front of the courtroom. It is up one riser. When you get there, please remain standing, raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Uh, my name is Scott Craig, S-C-O-T-T, -T, last name C-R-A-I-G. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Mr. Craig, how old are you? I'm um, 48 years old. And what kind of work do you do? Um, I work for a local company as a structured cabling surveillance technician. And how long have you been uh, working in that field? Uh, 25 years. Mr. Craig, do you know a woman named Jessie Krzyzewski? I do. And is the woman you know as Jessie Krzyzewski in the courtroom today? Yes. Could you please identify her by where she's seated and uh, perhaps what color her shirt is? Um, she's right over there in the peach colored sweater. Thank you. I'd ask uh, by pointing and describing her shirt, Mr. Craig has identified the defendant, Ms. Krzyzewski. Thank you. Mr. Craig, how is it you know Ms. Krzyzewski? Um, 
we were a boyfriend and girlfriend for three years, three and a half years. What was that time span? From when until when were those three to three and a half years? Um, from spring of 2016 till the summer of 2019. Did you meet her in uh, spring of 2016, or had, had you known her previous to dating her? Um, we were acquaintances previously, um, but formally talking to her was spring of 2016. And over that three to three and a half years, would you say the relationship became serious? Yes. Did you ever live together? Yes. For how long did you live together? Um, probably three years. And was that at a house you purchased together or one of your previous homes? How did that work? Um, I rent a home and she, she um, most of the time lived with me. She was also living with her mother at the time, but for the majority of the time she was living with me. And did the two of you ever have children together? No. To your knowledge, did Ms. Kraszewski have any children of her own? No. Do you have children of your own? Yes. And uh, did Ms. Kraszewski take well to your kids? Yes. Did your kids seem to like her as well? Definitely. And how many kids do you have, sir? Four. Was that true of all four, would you say? Yes, definitely. Okay. While you were dating for these three to three and a half years, what kind of activities would you do together? Um, we would go out to lo local pubs. Um, we had common friends, so hung out with friends, had um, you know barbecues and things at the house, at other people's houses. Um, sporting events for the kids. My kids were heavily involved in sports, especially my daughter at the time. So we would go to softball tournaments, tournaments throughout Wisconsin, um, sometimes in Illinois. Okay. Did you and Ms. Krzyzewski ever go to casinos? Yes. How frequently would you say you went together? Um, it was off and on. Sometimes we would go, you know, two to three times a month, sometimes more than that. Sometimes we wouldn't go for months on end. Okay. And was that true of that kind of sporadic uh, in those three years or three and a half years you were dating? Yes. Okay. Did you know what Ms. Kraszewski was doing for a job while you were dating her? Um, she had a job at a dental office I, I knew of, and then she had another job at another medical type office as a administrative type job within another medical office. Were those two jobs she was working at the same time throughout the three to three and a half years, or were they different there, times? There were different times. Okay. And was she, to your knowledge, consistently employed that total uh, three to three and a half year time span? No, for the first six months, I knew she did not have a job. Um, so, but then, so she didn't have a job, I knew, for about the first six months. Okay. Beyond that first six months, did you believe she was employed consistently for the rest of your relationship? Yeah, there was probably a, maybe a couple month period between those two jobs that she wasn't, but then she ended up getting another job. Okay. Did you ever discuss with Ms. Kraszewski how much money she made at these jobs? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Okay. Did you ever group your bills together, for example? Um, bills themselves, no, we didn't group our bills together. Did you ever add her to any credit cards as a second user? No. Uh, did you add her um, to any of your bank accounts as a second user? No. Did she add you to any of her accounts that you know of? No. Okay, so you kind of kept your finances separate from one another. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay, you just have to answer out loud so the woman Sorry. in front of you can take it down. Sorry it's okay. About that. Now, when you would go to the, the local pubs, as you said, did you pay attention to how much money Ms. Krzyzewski would spend? Um, at times I would pay attention, you know, at times I didn't because, you know, it's not my business of how much money somebody's spending or not spending all the time. So there were times I did, but times I didn't. Okay. And when you went out, you would spend your own money, correct? Yes. Okay. Roughly how much money would you spend out at the, a night at the bars? Um, it would, it would. Subject to relevance. Background? Well, I'm just trying to establish what he spent and what he was paying attention to Ms. Krzyzewski spending for the last two and three classes. <laughs> All right, overruled, he may answer. Um, it would vary from what we spent. You know, sometimes we'd go to the bar and only spend $50. Sometimes we'd go and spend $100 a piece. It would just depend on the day or the evening or what was going on for that particular trip to the bars. Okay. 
And you referenced we would spend. Is it fair to say you and Ms. Krzyzewski were either you might pick up the bill sometimes or she might pick up the bill for the both of you at times? Yeah, correctly. I mean, sometimes I would run a tab and it would be all under, you know, some night it would be all under my tab. There'd be nights that it would all be under her tab. Okay. And you said that it wasn't really your business how much anybody else was spending, correct? Yes. Okay. So you didn't really pay attention to what Ms. Krzyzewski was spending. Is that fair? Well, yes. Okay. Yes. What about these times you would go to the casinos? Did you pay attention to how much Miss Kershesky was spending? Um, at times, yes. She would probably do the same with me. You know, we would tell each other how, how things were going as we were there. Okay. And anything that stood out about Miss Kershesky spending at the casino to you? Uh, at the time, no. Okay. How much money would you typically spend at the casino on a given night? Again, it would vary, you know, sometimes. You could spend $100, you know, the maximum I probably lost at a casino is maybe $1,000. Um, sometimes we would def win money, so it was different every single time. Let's talk about that for a second. When you would win money, what kind of amounts are we talking about? Um, sometimes you win a couple thousand dollars. Um, sometimes it would be a few hundred dollars, you know, and then you would maybe take that and try to, you know, go and play some more or just leave and go home with the money that you won. Okay. When you say you would sometimes win a couple thousand dollars, is that around five thousand, less, more? How would you put it? It would be mostly probably less than five thousand. Okay. Prior to October third of two thousand eighteen, did you ever win any jackpots bigger than five thousand dollars that you can remember? Prior to that, no. Did you ever see up until October third of two thousand eighteen, did you ever see Miss Krzyzewski win any big jackpots while you were with her? No. Okay. So nothing over $5,000 in your time with Ms. Krzyzewski up until October 3rd of 2018? Correct. Now, after October of 2018, uh, was there a pretty big jackpot you won? Correct. How did that go? Um, we were at a casino late one evening, and we won a jackpot. I think it was in November of 2018 um, for $70,000. Okay. Now you said we won that. Yeah. How did the two of you both win that jackpot? Well, we were ended up sitting together, so we always kind of said, you know, we would always mostly try to split what was happening when we were at the casino. So when I say we won it, we were sitting together at the machine. Understood. And did you split that jackpot then 50-50? Yes. Okay. Did you take the money and sort of deposit it in your account and then give her a check, or did she do that, or how did it work? How did you split it? Um... When we left the casino, we each got $5,000 cash, and then Jesse received a check for $60,000. Okay. And did she ever share some of that $60,000 with you? Uh, yes. Okay. Did she write you a check, do you think? I'm not sure how it was. I'm not sure how it was given to me. I don't remember. I don't recall. Okay. Beyond that $70,000 jackpot in November of 2018, any significant jackpots that you can remember while at the casinos with Ms. Krzyzewski? No. Switching gears a little bit, this was a serious relationship with Ms. Krzyzewski, you said, correct? Correct. Did you meet family members of hers? Yes. Uh, specifically her mother, Jennifer Flower? Yes. How many times would you say you met Jennifer Flower? Um, I would probably say... Oh, six, uh, eight times, nine times. Okay. Did you meet any other family members of Ms. Kershevsky? Uh, I met her grandmother. Did you know of a Lynn Hernan? Yes. Did you ever meet Lynn Hernan? No, I did not. How is it you knew about Lynn Hernan? Um, when I first met Jesse, um, throughout those first few months, she told me of a friend of hers that was like a mother figure, and her name was Lynn. Did you know anything more about Lynn sort of early on in your relationship other than it was a family friend of Ms. Krzyzewski's? At the time, no, I didn't really know anything else. I knew she lived in Pewaukee. Jesse talked to her a few, you know, a few times a week on the phone, um, went and visited her. Uh, so I just knew of her as a good, close friend of Jesse's. When you met Jennifer Flower, Ms. Krzyzewski's mom, was that at your request or did Ms. Krzyzewski want you to meet her mom? Um, I think she wanted me to meet her. When it came to Lynn Hernan, you said Ms. Krzyzewski was going out to Pewaukee to visit her? Correct. 
Where were the two of you living? What municipality? Um, West Dallas. So she was leaving your house in West Dallas to go to Pewaukee? Correct. How many times per month, if you had to say? At least four times, at least once a week, for sure. Four times a month. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Did Ms. Kershewski ever ask you to come with her on these visits? Uh, no. Was there ever a time that you offered to come with on a visit to Ms. Hernan? Yes. And did you get to go then? No. Why not? She said that Lynn was kind of a recluse. Um, she didn't feel, you know, Lynn didn't feel good about herself, and she was kind of just kept to herself, and she didn't want to meet people, I guess. Okay. That's kind of how it was left. And was that sort of explanation consistent to you between 2016 and 2019? Yes. So you never met Lynn Hearn? No. Up until about spring of 2018, so for that first two-year period, how would you describe your relationship with Ms. Kershewski? Was it pretty solid? Was it sort of off and on? How would you describe it? It was pretty solid. I mean, there were times where, like normal relationships, where things would get a little, I don't even know how to say it. Um, I guess I don't know how to answer that. I mean, where, where you have, you know, small problems here and there, but it was pretty solid. Okay. You've referenced that your relationship with Ms. Kershewski went until the summer of 2019, correct? Correct. What was it that happened in the summer of 2019 that caused that end to the relationship? Um, when Waukesha Sheriff's Department came to my house and took her away. They arrested her? Correct. Did they do anything else as it relates to your house? Yes. What was that? Um, obviously they were looking for evidence, pretty much destroyed everything in my house as far as ransacking it, looking for things. They had a search warrant, is that correct? Correct. And then they, they searched your house, right? Mm-hmm. You said yes. Correct, yes. Thank you. And they went through everything you said? Correct. Did they at some point talk to you? Yes. At your house that same day? Yes. Do you recall what day that was specifically? July 9th. Of 2019? Of 2019. In that conversation um, some Sheriff's Department personnel had with you, did they ask if they could have your cell phone? Yes. Did they tell you why they wanted your cell phone? Uh, they basically just said that they... Here, sir. Um, sustain. Did you give over your cell phone? Yes, I did. Did you get that cell phone back rather quickly? Yeah, yes, within two days I got it back. Okay. Two days later. Was it your understanding that police wanted to look through your phone? Yes. Okay. And that's what you were agreeing to give them your phone for? Sustain this to the form of the question. Okay. Mr. Craig, why did you give your phone over to the sheriff's personnel? So they could use it as get gain evidence from my phone, I guess, going through calls and text messages. Okay. Did they ever tell you you were a suspect of anything? No. Did they tell you quite the opposite? <coughs> yes. Object. As to leading? Object to hearsay. Okay, if I'm mind you. Object to leading. Sustain as sustain as to the form of the question he may answer. What was the question again? He'll rephrase it. Thank you. Did you, were you ever led to believe in this conversation that you were a suspect in anything? No, I was not. Mm -hmm. So when you say you gave over your phone so the sheriff's department could look for evidence, what do you mean by that? Well, at the time I didn't know what anything meant. I just figured that was standard protocol for what they were doing. Okay. I'd like to bring up exhibit 183, please, <coughs> just to the witness. It's up. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Craig, can you see Exhibit 183 based on that little sticker in the bottom right corner in front of you on the screen? Yes. <coughs> yes. Okay. 
And if I could have Mr. Balkanier scroll down to page five of that exhibit. Mr. Craig, are you able to see how many pages that exhibit is? Um, according to the right side, it says five. Okay. And if you could just, as Ms. DeVolcanier slowly scrolls up, could you just read? Uh, actually, let me ask you this first. In reading some of the messages that are on the screen, do you believe, you know, whose phone these messages were taken from? Thank you. Um, yes, they're from Jesse's phone. From Jesse's phone? They were, kind of looks like a conversation between Jesse and I. Okay. Do you know whose phone they were taken off of? Um, looks like my, my phone. Regardless, as you read through these messages, you believe this is a conversation between yourself and Jesse, you said? Yes. Is that Jesse Krzyzewski? Yes. And as we slowly scroll up the five pages, More technological No. Oh, yeah, I don't know what happened. Just bear with us, Mr. Craig. We'll get it back up for you. Yeah. We have to go with the hard copies. Let me just. There you go. Back up. It's back up. And Mr. Craig, to be fair, prior to testifying today, you and I met with one another, is that correct? Correct. And I showed you certain portions of these messages that I'd probably be asking you about during today's trial, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So you've seen this before? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us generally what this conversation with you and Ms. Krzyzewski was about? Um, it seems that it were, we were out one night and... We got into an argument about, I really don't know exactly what it was about, but this happened from time to time where we got into arguments and I was, looks like I was very upset and I was trying to break up with her. In what date uh, was this conversation as we've scrolled up from page five? Uh, do you recall what date that conversation took place? It looks like 5-13 of 2018. Okay, so about mid-May of 2018? Yes. And if we could go to page two of five. And Mr. Craig, do you see on the left side, and if we can actually scroll down, Mr. Balkanier, just on that same page two of exhibit 183. Judge, I believe that the witness should be asked the question and only shown the exhibit if he needs to refresh his recollection. Has not been offered yet, so you lay a little more foundation and then we'll go from there. I'll sustain the objection at this time. I think the proper foundation will be laid through a later witness, but he has testified that this is a conversation he recalls between himself and Ms. Krzyzewski. You haven't established how he knows that. Understood. Mr. Craig, how is it you're able to say this is a conversation you had between yourself and Ms. Krzyzewski? I guess I don't understand the question. And you can stop publishing. I mean, stop publishing to the witness, please. I want him to answer the questions from his memory. As you looked through those messages briefly, do you recall having that conversation with Ms. Krzyzewski? Yes. Okay. And Bits and pieces of it, yes. Understood. And in the midst of that conversation, you said you were, it, it appeared to you, or you recall trying to end the relationship with Ms. Krzyzewski? Correct. And around that time, May 13th of 2018, you recall Ms. Krzyzewski telling you something about Lynn Hernan? Yes. And what was that? That Lynn had um, overdosed on pills. Okay. And did she say what happened as a result of Ms. Hernan overdosing on pills? 
that she was admitted into freighter because she was in coma. And did she tell you anything else subsequent to that about Lynn recovering or anything like that? About recovered? I'm not, I guess I don't understand. Sure. So in May of 2018, you said Ms. Krzyzewski told you that Lynn Hernan was in a coma after overdosing on pills, correct? Correct. Was there ever a time after May of 2018 that Ms. Krzyzewski told you something along the lines of, Hey, great news, Lynn is recovered, she's back home. Jeff, leading, sustained, rephrase. Did Ms. Krzyzewski ever tell you any news or updates on Ms. Hernan's condition? Yes. And what was that? That um, nothing has changed with her condition. She was still in the hospital and in a coma. Um, and that was, that was it. So that was in May of 2018. Yes? Yes. If we fast forward to October of 2018, did Ms. Krzyzewski tell you any news about Lynn Hearn? Yeah, that's in October of 2018 that she had passed away. Where did you believe Lynn Hernan passed away? Um, in Freighter Medical Center. And why did you believe that? Because she was in a coma at Freighter. For... Who gave you that information? Jesse. So you believed between May and October of 2018 that Lynn Hernan was in a coma at Freighter? Yes. Did Ms. Kershewski ever tell you that was not true? Um, after the fact, after her arrest, on phone calls from the prison, yes. So, how, is that how you first found out that entire story about the coma and freighter was untrue? No, that's not how I found out. How did you find out? I found out two days after Jesse's arrest from um, Detective Hoppy. You remember looking at messages between your well let me ask you this do you remember in August of 2018 did you and Ms. Krzyzewski take any trips that you can recall um, not that I can recall okay did you look at any messages prior to testifying where you indicated to another person in your life that you were taking a trip yes and where was that trip to uh, Wisconsin Dells do you recall who that trip was with? Uh, Jesse. And do you recall roughly what time? Um, I don't recall what time, like time of day. No, what time of year was that trip? Oh, it would have been in, I don't recall actually, the summer possibly. Summer of what year? 2018. Did you and Ms. Krzyzewski go to the Wisconsin Dells often, would you say? No. How many times do you think you and her went to the Dells? Um, we probably went once together personally, but we there was a couple other times where my daughter had softball tournaments and we were maybe in that area. On any of those trips that, whether they were just you and Ms. Krzyzewski or for your daughter, mm -hmm. did you bring Lynn Hernan along with you? No. Moving ahead to uh, early 2019, you were still with Ms. Krzyzewski? Correct. And in fact, let's back up for a second, because in May of 2018, you told us that you were trying to end the relationship with her, correct? Correct. You didn't ultimately end the relationship with her? No, I did not. Why not? Um, it was a few days later is when I actually found out the news about Lynn, and that seemed to be like a bigger, a bigger thing to worry about at that time when she was going into the hospital. Um, and I could tell Jesse was very distraught about it, so that's not the ultimate reason why we didn't, but I just kind of put it aside, you know, let, let things go, and because it was basically just probably a frivolous type fight anyways, the more I thought about it. Okay, and so your relationship continued? Yes. And in early 2019, were you and Ms. Krzyzewski still living together? Yes. And did there come a time where she had a conversation with you about needing to go to the hospital. Yes. What do you remember about that? There was a number of times that she needed to go to, a, to, go to the hospital. Um, so I don't remember any, there was a lot of reasons why she had to go to the hospital, you know, obviously go to, to go and see her. 
um, sometimes to go sign papers for medical delivery, things of that nature. I see. So if I understand you correctly, you're talking about Ms. Krzyzewski needing to go to the hospital to visit Lynn. Correct. Was there ever a time in early 2019 where Ms. Krzyzewski told you she had to go to the hospital for her own medical needs? Yes. And how did that go? Um, she was out with some friends. Um, they went to a, another local pub to go see a concert, and she believed that somebody had drugged her and she wasn't feeling well, and she had to go to the, go to the doctor. Did she go to the doctor or the hospital? Well, the hospital. And how was she relaying this information to you? Uh, through text messages. And did she ultimately tell you that the doctors had concluded something? Yes. And what was that? They said that she ingested Visine. Did she use the word Visine or a different word? Do you remember? Well, she said it was tet some medical tetra. I don't know the exact name. Tetra something. Okay. Um, but in the end, she clarified that it was the chemical in Visine. So it, this chemical was in Visine. And do you recall what month and what year that a text conversation with you and Ms. Krzyzewski occurred in? I don't recall exactly, no. Okay. Was it before or after Lynn Hernan's death? After. Do you recall what you were thinking as you were receiving these text messages about your girlfriend being poisoned? I was very irate, very mad, wondering who could do this to her. Had you personally ever heard about uh, tetrahydrazoline or eye drops being poisoning people? No. Did you know anything about it? No, not at all. Did Ms. Krzyzewski in those messages tell you if it was serious or nothing to worry about? She said it was serious, yes. And you took it seriously? Yes. Did you try to take any action after she informed you that she thought she had been drugged? Yeah, I was, I was inquiring on who she was with, you know, where she was, where she was afterwards, beforehand, um, trying to figure out who could have done something like this to her. Okay, why were you asking about that? Well, because I was very concerned that, you know, if it was somebody, a friend of ours, I just wanted to get to the bottom of actually what happened to her because it was very, it was a bad thing, obviously. Did you ever get to the bottom of it? No, I never did. How did that situation resolve itself? Um, after a few weeks, it just kind of fizzled out and we never really, it never really came up again because I figured I wasn't going to find out who did it. At any time between those text messages where she told you she had been drugged and her arrest on July 9th of 2019, did Ms. Krzyzewski ever tell you that that wasn't a true story? No. Did you later learn it was not a true story? Yes. Got that would call for hearsay. Um, overruled, his answer may stand. He. Next question. Thank you. And Mr. Craig, moving on to sort of my final points. You said the relationship ended when Ms. Krzyzewski was arrested, correct? Yes. You also referenced receiving calls from her after she was arrested, though? Yes. If the relationship had ended, why were you continuing to take calls from Ms. Krzyzewski? Um, because I was very confused. I didn't know what was happening. Um, obviously, I was trying to figure out how any of this could have happened. I was. I just wanted to hear what was going on in her end of it. Um, so that's why I, I was just trying to figure out what was happening. And would she call you frequently from the jail or just once every great while? For the first six months, it was about once a week. It kind of fizzled out towards the end of those six months. But Okay, let me stop you there. I'm going to pull up Exhibit 54, please. And Mr. Craig, if we play that first portion of the video, that first one minute and 38 seconds, um, was there a way you knew you were getting a call from a, a jail? Um, I think it came up as a, well, depending on where she was, but it came up as an unknown caller or it would come up as Waukesha County Jail. Was it Ms. Krzyzewski's voice right away or was there some sort of automated, almost robotic voice that you had to listen to first? It was... It was an automated message 
saying that there was a call coming from, and then it would be Jesse's voice saying, Jesse. Yeah. Um, prior to doing that, I want to advise the jury that to the extent that you're hearing about testimony, Ms. Kershevsky may have been in custody or incarcerated or in jail. Please be advised that that does not have any bearing on her guilt or innocence and should not in any way be used against her, uh, meaning used against Ms. Kershevsky when you ultimately deliberate. Do you still want a sidebar? All right, go ahead, uh, Attorney Sitzberger. Thank you, Your Honor. And just for the record, Exhibit 54 is divided into two separate audio clips. The first one is uh, from zero minutes till one minute and 38 seconds. And if Mr. Volkmeier could play that, please. Call number 8082618686. In the ID 1488412. to reject it? Yes. And you accepted it? Correct. You heard the, the human voice say the word Jesse, correct? Yes. Do you know that to be Jesse Kershevsky's voice? Yes. If we could uh, continue on with the second audio clip, which is from timestamp of this particular file, 6 minutes, 44 seconds, until 10 minutes, 5 seconds. You really have nothing to say to me, do you? No. Greg, in that brief uh, audio clip, did you recognize the two voices we've heard so far? Yes. And who are the two voices? Um, Jesse and myself. Thank you. I'd, and I'm sorry, by Jesse, who do you mean? Jesse Kraszewski. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, I'd move Exhibit 54 to evidence. Exhibit 54 is received. Thank you. And then I'd ask to continue playing that second audio file to its conclusion. Don't. What the hell do you expect? I don't understand why you're being this mean. It doesn't even make sense. Hmm. Right. I'm not being mean at all. I'm being what any normal human being would be in this situation. I don't know you, Jesse. 
Yes, you do. No, I don't. I don't. Nobody makes up lies like that to their person they love. You don't love anybody. I don't love anybody? No, you don't. You don't yeah. lie to people. You don't lie to people and make up so many lies. That's About really one good. thing. One, no, thing. one thing. Our whole life was not a lie. Yeah, I was. No, it wasn't. How can you even say that? Very easily, because you lied to me about something very serious. Then you told a bunch of other lies on top of that to my family about her being in the hospital and being brought back to life. You just kept making up more and more lies. You're diabolical. That's just crazy. Crazy. I can't even believe it. Do you know what it's doing to my mind, knowing that I was living with somebody like that? is continuing to be played, which is just this witness is perception of things. These are not uh, statements of Jesse. This is witness's impression. It's improper. The exhibit was received without objection. Um, the state may continue playing it. Thank you. You may cross-examine on that. And you never even skipped a beat. It didn't even bother you. It, it didn't bother me. It bothered the shit out of me, Scott. There's well, a reason I didn't, I didn't let you I know the shit. I couldn't tell. Whatever. I couldn't tell. There is no reason why you didn't let me know the shit. You should have let somebody else know. Like the police. Or a mental institution. Or something. Not what the heck you did. It's just sick. It's so sick and disgusting. We act like that was our whole three and a half years together, and it wasn't. Well, it takes precedence over everything, trust me. No, it doesn't. Nothing for you, Jesse, because you're not a normal person. It does for me. You never once thought that I was keeping you from anything so you wouldn't know, so you wouldn't be a part of anything? So you wouldn't be hurt, so you wouldn't be involved? Why the hell would I think anything even close to what was going on? She's, I was told. She's in the hospital. You're she was in the, the hospital. hospital numerous times. Well, not in a coma for five months. That's what you told me. So, I know that's what I told you. Yeah, I told I you know. that to protect that's you for a reason. That's pretty disgusting. That's a disgusting thing to lie about. Mr. Craig, at the end of that audio file... Did you hear Ms. Grzeszewski tell you she was trying to protect you? Yes. Do you know what she meant by that? Yeah. Overruled, he may answer. Speculation what's in the Jesse's mind. Um, the way it was phrased, he may answer. No, I don't know what she meant by that at the time. And throughout your three to three and a half year history, did Ms. Grzeszewski ever express to you that she was concerned about Lynn and her mental health? Yes. And in what way? Uh, she said that Lynn um, was a drinker. Um, she used pills before medications. I don't know if they were prescribed or not. Um, she was suicidal, um, things of that nature. That was all from Ms. Krzyzewski telling you that? Yes. You never got to meet Lynn, though, correct? Correct. And again, as far as the pill comment, that led into Ms. Hernan having uh, suffered a coma and being in the hospital, Object correct? Meeting. Sustained us to the form of the question. Sorry. Mr. Craig, how did the pill comment specifically come up as it relates to Ms. Hernan? As far as? Did Ms. Krzyzewski just say, oh, she uses pills? Or was that the basis for Ms. Hernan's hospitalization, according to Ms. Krzyzewski? Well, that was, that was the reason that I was told that she was in a coma, because of pills and alcohol. And you later learned that was not true? Correct. 
calls for hearsay. So overruled, um, the way it was asked is sufficient. I'm sorry, could you just repeat your last answer, sir? Correct. Thank you, sir. That's all the questions I have. Cross. Judge, could we um, have the lunch break now and begin the cross after lunch? It's not going to be done in 10 minutes or even 20. All right, that's fine. We'll take our lunch break then. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you, be seated, sir. You can step down for now. Please be mindful you're still uh, under subpoena, under oath, and subject to the exclusion uh, order that I previously entered, okay? But you can step down and go back uh, to the victim witness room. I do want to make a note or a record regarding the objection from the defense just now regarding uh, the phone call, first of all, there was no objection when the state offered it, number one. Number two, context is important. The rule of completeness kicks in as well. Um, uh, it would be, obviously, the statements come in as against Ms. Kershevsky as a statement by a party opponent. Moreover, this witness is on the stand testifying regarding the phone call um, not only with the rule of completeness, but I think best evidence as well as to what his uh, impressions were at that time based upon uh, his tone of voice and the questioning that was going on. He's also subject to cross-examination, so that's why I overruled uh, that objection. Then we also had a sidebar at the request of the defense, um, and it had to do with this witness's um, repeated reference to either jail or custody, custodial status. Um, the state had indicated at sidebar, that's why the state was trying to lead the subject through. I asked if the witness had been advised about my prior rulings, and the state confirmed it had. Uh, obviously, the concern is we knew some of this would come up. Everyone, we've talk, talked about this at prior court hearings. Obviously, want to limit any repeated references to her custodial status. I did give the limiting instruction. The defense uh, appreciated that. Uh, but given, um, you know, my observation of his testimony, I indicated the state could lead on that limited topic in order to avoid any further or limiting further references. Um, so I wanted to make a record of those things. Anything from the state as it relates to those things? No, thank you, Your Honor. Right, anything from the defense? No, you, I think you stated accurately. I was concerned because he had mentioned the word prison, and he had also uttered the phrase multiple institutions. And so those two things concern the defense. Understood. All right, then um, I want to start back up at 1.10. Um, I think given the fact that our jurors don't leave and they're back there, I think I'm going to start shortening our lunch times uh, to between an hour and an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so just so that everyone can plan accordingly, I'm not uh, <laughs> in any way getting close to the time that the cafeteria closes for our defense team. I know last week I think that was an issue. My apologies to that, although I wanted to get that witness completed, which was my goal in all of that. So. Um, you know, we'll shoot for around noon each day, give or take. Um, it was a good stopping point, so thank you, Attorney Kukler. We'll see everyone back here at 1.10. We are in recess.
issues because it's just the technology, but let's just do a test on both sides. I know Zach was in here testing the tables for the, and there was a del six second delay sometimes, but. Yeah, go ahead. We're gonna shoot over there. Record then, uh, State of Wisconsin versus Jesse Kershevsky, uh, 21 CF 885. Appearances are as they were before. Uh, Attorney Kukler. Your Honor, uh, we're going to begin the cross exam of Scott Craig this afternoon. The state played uh, the jail call between Jesse and, and Mr. Craig, and during it, he uh, provided. Uh, opinions about what was going on in the case and Jesse's, um, that she's a liar and, and all sorts of negative things that he had to say about her. I intend during his cross-exam to go into the fact that the things that he believed about Jesse didn't come from Jesse but came from talking to detectives and I plan to go into uh, so that we can uh, understand what was in his mind and why he thought what he did, I plan to go in the statements that detectives told him that led him to form those opinions. All right, any comment from the state? I think this is an issue we have to take piece by piece as it comes in. There was certainly some of the same that I tried to ask about that was objected by Attorney Kukler as hearsay. So I'm somewhat surprised she wants to get into the same area she objected to me asking about. But again, I, I think it's something that has to be evaluated as it happens. I don't know that there can be a blanket rule that it's permissible or impermissible at this point. This is only related to the jail call. So normally, any statements attributed to another witness other than a party opponent would be hearsay unless offered for another purpose. Obviously, you can question uh, this witness about the source of his knowledge. I don't think there's anything improper about that. I frankly would expect that. But are you telling me that you're going to ask with specificity what information he was provided by the detectives in this case. Yes. And I believe that's what the state was then indicating should be taken up piece by piece. Not yes, I mean, I would say with that blanket statement, I would object to it as hearsay. I think the jail call pretty clearly lays out that Ms. Krzyzewski acknowledged that the one story of Ms. Hernan being in a coma for five months was untrue and that was confirmed by herself in the call. So I'm not, I guess it's hard to say because I'm not sure how far we're going with what the police told Mr. Craig. I think sometimes it depends on how you ask the questions. If you say, did you have information that led you to believe and was the source of that information the Sheriff's Department, Detective Hoppy, De uh, Detective Cole, whatever the case may be, that doesn't call for hearsay, it's an acknowledgement. If the witness is asked for, to just narrate what the information was, 
I think I'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. The state may object. The state may not object. I uh, won't know, I guess, unless there, an objection is made, whether I need to rule on it or not. There could be many reasons why parties don't object to hearsay um, or um, attorney Kukler, if there's another reason you'd be offering that other than for the truth of the matter asserted. Right, for the rule of completeness as well. Because some of the things that are said uh, in that call by, by Mr. Craig, it's unclear. It could be inferred that he heard those things from Jesse, and I'm not talking about the coma. I'm just talking about other things that he's suggesting that she was lying about or that, that she's a liar about, could be, the jury could be thinking that he heard this information from Jesse when it is not accurate. The information came via law enforcement. Well, the rule of completeness would refer to either a writing or a recording where the rule of completeness would support the inclusion of for example, uh, showing a jury an entire recorded interview where parts have been redacted, if the parts that have been redacted would clearly relate to the context of something that came in or help explain. So the rule of completeness would not be what I would rely upon in this case. However, I'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I've already indicated I think some of this would be proper cross-examination. Um, it also goes to the context of what was going on, Judge. So, well, the context of the phone call or the context of the investigation? The investigation. I mean, I think, I mean, you can tread, I would say tread lightly. I mean, you've already objected based upon uh, the circumstances of the phone calls and being in custody. That's why I let Attorney Sisberger lead the witness. So I think you kind of do that at your peril. Be careful what you ask for because he may then give an answer that highlights that information. Obviously, you can lead him, as you know, so I would expect that you'll do that. Um, I'll take it up piece by piece as need be. And... Um, if there's an objection, I'll rule on it. If I feel I need additional arguments, I'll excuse the jury. All right. And then I put it on the record, but I've lost the use of my computer over the lunch hour. The screen has broken. I did not drop it. I'm trying to get a replacement computer. You, thank you. You indicated because I asked if there was a backup, and it sounds like you're, you have a backup at the office. Obviously, that's something that needs to be worked through, but it sounds like you at least have that. And then anything you thought you needed, you had the office email to Attorney Galavis. For this witness. For this particular witness. Correct. All right. Um, so let me know if when we get, if we get to the next witness after this, which I hope we do, um, if there's a need for a short break just to make sure you have everything. Um, and uh, we'll work with you as best as we can. We do have the flash drive that you gave us, so and if that can be helpful in any way, uh, plugging that into Attorney Galavis's computer. I know that. I think that's the updated exhibits from your office today. Um, Madam Clerk will make that available as well. So with that, then, let's have the jury brought up, then, Madam Clerk. to the witness stand. And if you need, there is water up there as well. Thank you. You're welcome.
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Mr. Craig, you are back on the witness stand. We are after the lunch hour to acknowledge that you remain under oath. Yes. All right. Go ahead, Attorney Kukler. Thank you. On October 3rd of 2018, Jesse texted you at 5.18 p.m. to tell you that Lynn had died. Isn't that true? Correct. When you were first interviewed by the police, you had told them that you got that text when you were still at work. That that was not correct. True. I didn't know the exact timing of it when they asked me. But it was when you were already at home. Um, I could have been at home. I could have been in transit. I, I'm not exactly sure. You saw Jesse that evening, true? I don't recall. Do you remember telling the police that she was distraught and crying that evening? Uh, yes, I do remember that. Okay. So then you did see her that evening? Yes. That's what I said, you, yes. You remember saying that now? Yes. Okay. You told the jury this morning about your home being ransacked. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was when law enforcement came over to execute a search warrant. That's what I understood, right? Correct. And that did make you upset? Yes. Because it really trashed your house, true? Yes. I mean, no physical damage, but just everything was everywhere. So the drawers were empty? Correct. Closets were going, going through? Correct. It was a big mess? Yes. You were mad? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. They were looking to see whatever they could find, that whatever they were looking for. You don't know, but they looked through everything. Correct. You'd agree that you never saw Visine bottles laying around your house? Correct. You never saw Visine bottles in Jesse's car, for example? No, I did not. And as far as you know, when the police... Uh, executed a warrant, they didn't uh, recover any visine. As far as I know, no. You'd agree with me that during the, well, you were uh, you were living together for how many years? Three? Uh, roughly three years. A little bit longer? Yeah, possibly a little bit longer. Three, you three knew years. each other for six years? Yes, I, I, I we were acquaintance um, years prior. Um, I knew that she worked at a at a local pub as a waitress. Um, we never really spoke then, but I knew of her, yes. And then you dated and lived together? Yes. And your your kids, you said this morning, like Jesse? Yes, very much so. She got along well with your youngest son? <laughs> yes. How old was he at that time? At that time, he was, How I believe, was he, believe he was two. He was two? Yes. You had him every other weekend? Yes. And Jesse would pick him up, for yes, example? Yes, Do things with him? Yes. And you knew that Jesse and her mother, Jennifer, and Lynn, they were all old-time friends? Yes. You'd agree with me that Jesse saw Lynn much more during the last six to seven months of her life than she had earlier in your relationship? Yes. When you were with Jesse, you never saw her making any what you would call extravagant purchases, true? True. But you 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 all as a family certainly did buy some gifts, right? Yes. And you buy gifts for Christmas and birthdays, for example. Correct. Um, for for the children. Yes. And even uh, occasionally for the ex wife. Yes. You had a good relationship with her, true, the ex-wife? Yes, very good. The mother of the children? Yes. You mentioned this morning about gambling at the casino. That's one of those things that you and Jesse like to do. Correct. Basically, you go to Potawatomi, as I understand that. That's correct. Downtown Milwaukee. Correct. And you said that uh, your gambling varied... Sometimes you might gamble $100, maybe another time it's $500. Correct. And you, you mentioned uh, having uh, won money on occasion. Mm -hmm. 
yes, yes, and sometimes you lose money. Correct. And there were times that you won more than, you won as much as, uh, besides that 70000 that you mentioned, there were times you won, for example, $6,000 or $5,000. Those kind of numbers happened also. Um, correct, I would say. I don't specifically remember the amounts, but yes, we would win some money sometimes. Did you, the two of you usually play on slot machines? Yes. And did you have a player's card? Yes, I did for, for a short period of time, yes. Uh, and, and by that I mean a player's card for Potawatomi. Correct. And a player's card, would you agree with me, is something that, that you can ask the casino to issue you and then you use it when you play, when you, when you play there? Correct. And if you're playing at a slot machine, you, you would take your player's card and insert it in the machine before you, start, before you put your money in? Correct. And then does the casino track uh, your playing amounts? Yes. And then in return for that, you might get some rewards from the casino. Correct. They might send you coupons in the mail, for example. Yes. Uh, they might comp you some meals. Yes. And so you would, you would typically use a player's card when you went to the casino, true? Um, not all the time. Sometimes I would not use it. And sometimes you'd use it? Yes. And sometimes J Jessie had her own card, right? I believe so, yes. And didn't you, isn't it true that sometimes you would use Jesse's card? Um, I don't recall. Do you remember telling the police that? Do you remember being interviewed by law enforcement on November 3rd, 2021? I uh, don't recall, no. Do you remember being asked about whether or not you would, um, whether you would ever borrow Jesse's player's card or whether Jesse would borrow your card. Do you remember? That's that? Pardon me. It's okay. Do you remember being asked about that? I don't remember that, no. Do you remember telling law enforcement that if you were playing together, you'd, we'd play her card? Or we'd play my card. Do you remember that? There were times when, if we were playing the cards that evening, there were probably times that that happened, yes. There were if we, times? If we were, if we were sitting next to each other. Okay. So if you were sitting next to each other at a slot machine? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Or if, we, if she was playing a machine or if I was playing a machine next to her. You might use somebody, each other's card. If we were, I don't know that we would use each other's card. Well, okay. Uh, so you don't recall telling law enforcement that sometimes you would use her card, or sometimes I she don't, would? I don't recall that, no. All right, then permission to play that part of the interview, which we've marked as exhibit. I'll give you the exhibit number. What's the number? 594, 595. 595. We're going to uh, play. A, a timestamp? 494. Yes. I'm sorry, 494, 594. And we are going to start at 432 and stop at 441. Any objection? No. Go ahead. Sometimes, I you know if we were playing together, we play her card, we play my card, so like that. Sometimes we wouldn't play a card at all. Okay. You know what I mean? Because I thought it was kind of bad juju to play the card. Did, was that your voice? Yes. Do you recall that now? Um, I recall it now because you just played it. Yes, that's what I'm asking. Yes. And so, is that true that sometimes you play her card, sometimes you play your card? Like I said, it depends if we were sitting next to each other and she was playing hers or I was. Playing my card, I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't physically grab her card and play it. We would just play, we would play together. So. So you might shake. So some one card might go on both machines. Then. Yeah, it's possible. Because you might be sitting next to each other. Exactly. And so it would be fair to say that the dollar amounts that were being gambled on one card or the other card um, might not be completely accurate as to the person because you might have been sharing a card. 
Correct. With regard to the big jackpot that you said you won in November 2018, do you remember talking about that? Correct. Congratulations, that's a big amount. Did you um, tell Jesse to declare that? Well, you told Jesse to declare that on her income taxes, isn't that true? Correct. And you're the one, though, that really won it, true? Uh, we, we, were, we were playing together next to each other. I was the one who pushed the button, yes. It was your machine that won it. Well, we were playing, we were sitting next to each other. She was not playing, we were both playing the same machine okay. as a couple next to each other at the same machine. All right, and you're the one that had hit, pressed the button yes. and won the jackpot. Correct. You didn't declare half of it on your tax return, true? I don't believe so. You said that you tried to end a relationship with Jesse on May 13th, 2018. Do you remember talking about that? Yes. And to be fair, the day before, you and she had been in a kind of stupid arguments, right? Correct. And is it fair to say that you were upset because you thought that Jesse had told people you were with that you like somebody named Whitney? Yeah, I do recall that. And you were embarrassed about that? Uh, I wasn't embarrassed. I was more so... I was just more so angry about it, of why this was even coming about, because it wasn't even something that was true, and I don't, it was kind of very childish. Well, I'm looking at your text message. Uh, it's all everyone was talking about last night. Absolutely embarrassing. Yeah. Just for the record, can we reference an exhibit number in, in line? That would be exhibit 186. Thank you. Page 3. Thank you. Can you bring up 186? So you were embarrassed? Yes. It was a lot of emotions, I guess. And that you, you and Jesse had been out drinking that night? Uh, yes. It sounds like an argument that happened after a night of drinking. Yes. Argument about somebody naming Whitney. Somebody named Whitney. Correct. And then after, and that, that argument went on with text messages for some time, true? Correct. And at some point you told her to stay away from the house, right? Correct. And you told her that if she, if, that you were going to call the police and report her as an, un, or an unknown uh, person. Yes. That you were going to pretend that she was a stranger trying to break into your house. Well, I wasn't right. going to pretend that. I was just trying to keep her from my house. Well, you told her that you were going to uh, lie to law enforcement and say she was an unknown person, true? Yes. As you understood stood Jesse's relationship with Lynn, you understood it to be that Jesse was like a daughter, daughter to Lynn, is that right? Correct. And you had been at Lynn's house at least after she died, right? You were at her condo? Yes, I was. You saw all the stuff that she had there? Correct. And when you were living with Jesse, at no time did you ever see at your house any mail um, or applications for credit cards, true? Correct.
when you, you uh, listened to earlier today that jail call uh, that you had with, with Jesse, what was in your head that day was based upon information that you had received from law enforcement. Correct. Between Jesse's arrest on July 9th and that jail call about 10, 10 days later or so, uh, you had spoken to law enforcement and they told you certain things. Yes. And so the information that was in your head was from them, not from Jesse, true? Correct. So any information in your mind about any type of poisoning, for example, came via law, came via law enforcement? Correct. Thank you. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Craig, uh, Attorney Kukler just asked you, among other things, if you ever saw at your house any credit card applications or mail. Do you recall that? Yes. Did Ms. Krzyzewski use your house for a mailing address, to your knowledge? Um, for her own personal use, yes. Did she have another form of getting mail, to your knowledge? Um, I was told that she had a peer. Object. Okay. Sustained. Thank you. Like I said, to your knowledge. Last part of the answer, I'll strike. Jury will disregard it. Please rephrase. Thank you. To your knowledge, sir, did she have any other ways of getting mail? Not what somebody might have told you, but did you know of any other ways she was getting mail? I'm going to object as the knowledge, any knowledge came via hearsay. Um, overall. Um, she had a P.O. box. Okay. And did you have access to that P.O. box? No. No. We just went through that sort of stupid fight you called it this morning, those text messages leading up to you trying to end the relationship, correct? Correct. Why were you so mad at Ms. Krzyzewski for whatever it was about? Um, just because I thought it was very childish and just the whole situation was kind of childish and it was a real nothing thing. And, you know, when you're out with friends and everybody's talking about something that's really not even there, I was very angry about it. Did you feel she was being truthful with that whole situation? No. And what do you recall? You told her to stay away from your house, I think Attorney Kukla asked you, you recall that? Yes. Was Ms. Krzyzewski respecting that? Um, I'm not sure if she was actually there or not. Okay, what was she telling you? She told me that she was at my house, but I don't believe I was there at that time. Had you uh, told her to stay away from your house at that point? Yes. You believe you told her once or multiple times? Uh, I believe multiple times through texting. Was it after those multiple times that the reference to calling the police was brought up? Yes. After those multiple times? Yes. You said that you did not see Ms. Krzyzewski making extravagant purchases during your relationship, correct? Correct. If I direct your attention to the sort of beginning half of October 2018, did anything uh, come to your house that you were unex you didn't expect? Um, there was some furniture that came to the house. What was that furniture? Um, it was a, a bedroom set for my room and my daughter's room and my son's room. So three bedroom sets? Yes. Had you discussed making such a purchase with Ms. Krzyzewski? Um, it was mentioned a couple of weeks prior. She said that we need new bedroom sets, and I said we don't need that at all. Everything's, I don't need anything like that. Um, and then I came home from work one day and all the stuff was in my front yard, the new, the new furniture. And you would agree that is something of an extravagant purchase? Yes, I would say so, yeah, I guess. 
And did the conversation after you said, we don't need any bedroom sets, did it ever get brought up again prior to you coming home and seeing those bedroom sets delivered? No. And were those bedroom sets delivered before or after Lynn Hernan's death on October 3rd? I believe it was after. Do you know how they were paid for? I do not know. Thank you, sir. That's all the questions I have. Anything else from the defense on this witness? Just looking at my notes. I would say no. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down. Your Honor, I would ask that Mr. Craig be released from a subpoena. Any objection? We have him under subpoena again, just as indicated earlier. We want to evaluate at the close of the state's case. Any objection to him being released from his subpoenas? Yes. Sir, you can step down. I'll address that at the next break. Thank you. All right, the state may call its next witness. The state calls Daniel Radloff. Sir, if you would please make your way to the witness stand. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Uh, Daniel Radloff, D A N I E L. R-A-D-L-O-F-F. -F. All right, thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Radlock, what do you do for work generally? Uh, I'm a contractor. Okay. Do you know someone named Scott Craig? Yes. How? Uh, he's my cousin. Okay. Have you ever lived with your cousin? Yes. About how long did you live with Mr. Craig? Four or five years, maybe. Okay. During that time, did you ever come to meet someone named Jesse Krzyzewski? Yes. And um, who was that? Uh, it was uh, Scott Craig's girlfriend at the time. Did she live in the house as well? Yes. So about how long would you say that you lived with Mr. Craig and Ms. Krzyzewski? Um, maybe a year and a half. Was there anyone else living in the residence? Scott's daughter and son, um, they lived there, but not full time. Okay. In terms of the time that you were living in the household with Mr. Craig and Ms. Uh, Krzyzewski, what was everyone at that point in time doing for work? I was still a contractor, Scott, um, worked uh, I can't remember the name of his company uh, Jesse I think was a dental assistant at the time okay did there come a time when you questioned Miss Krzyzewski's employment yes why was that I think that uh, there was days where things just didn't add up. Um, I was, I'd get up for work. She, uh, some days she would get ready and go to work. Other days I would come home at like 10 o'clock because it was raining and she would be home when she was supposed to be at work. So then that's what made me think something was not right. Okay. In terms of the amount of time that you were living there, did it seem like there was a certain time in the morning when Ms. Krzyzewski had to leave to go to work every day? 
I want to say around eight ish. Okay. I feel like that's when she would leave the house most days. What about other days? Um, other days, uh, she would take more time to get ready. She would leave, you know, nine, ten ish. Um, but you know, from day to day, it was it was different. Okay. When you say that she would get ready. Um, um, can you clarify the time frame sure. with the witness, please? So I'll sustain it for now. <laughs> About how long... Um, you said that you lived with Ms. Kershevsky for about a year, a year and a half? Yes. Was it every day during that year, year and a half that she would get ready to go to work in the morning? I object to vagueness as to what year. Well, was not asked. The witness can answer this question and then... So I'll overrule the objection. Can you ask the question again, please? Sure. So throughout the time that you lived with uh, Ms. Kershevsky, was it did it appear that every day she had to get up and get ready to go to work? No. Felt like it was very sporadic. Okay. Did you ever learn that in fact she wasn't going to work on some of those days? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, when there's an objection, you have to wait to answer, so I'll sustain it, strike his answer. Um, I'll sustain it as well due to vagueness as to the time frame we're talking about. Let's talk about the time frame. Do you remember, and this was many years ago at this point, right? Is that a yes? Yes. Thank you. When you first started living with your cousin, was Ms. Kraszewski already living there in the house? No. So there was a period of time when he wasn't dating her yet, is that true? Yes. Do you recall about how long that would have been? From when I moved in to when she moved in? Right. I would say about three years. Okay. Do you remember when you moved out of the residence? I don't remember the actual date. Okay. Did you, in this case, become aware that a search warrant was executed at that residence in July of 2019? No. You don't know that that happened? I, yes, I do know that that happened. Okay. At the time, I did not know it was happening. Understood. But yep. using that as kind of a point in time in your mind... When that occurred, were you still residing in the house? No. Do you know about how long it had been since you were living in the house? About a year. year okay. Now. So roughly, what would you say was the rough time that you were actually living in the home with Ms. Kraszewski and Mr. Craig then, in terms of months or years, if you can estimate that? So... You're asking me how long I lived in a house with her? Like when in t on a calendar, when in time that would have been? Like 2015 or 2018? I want to say 2018, but I, I'm not positive on that. You testified you think it was about a year after you moved out that the search warrant happened? Yes. These questions have been asked Overruled. Again, if there's an objection, make sure you wait to answer. Um, his answer may stand. So a year before July of 2019 would be July of 2018, right? Yes. Do you think that at that point you were living in the residence? Objection as to what he thinks. I mean, we want to know what he knows. Uh, sustained as to the form of the question. Were you living in the residence in July of 2018? Yes. I. It's a long time ago, so I... My memory is not that good, but I want to say yes. Okay. Nonetheless, did there become a point in time when you found out the defendant was actually just pretending to go to work every day? Judge, objection is the hearsay. Overrule. You may answer without saying what source of information it was, just his understanding. Yes. Who told you that? Jesse. What did she say? She... Can I elaborate a little? Yes. What, what did... Uh, it was... I think that she had known that I knew 
that she had not been working. And she told me one night when we were outside, it was just the two of us, that she had not been working for, I want to say four to six months, that she was lying about it. Did she say why? No. Was Mr. Craig there to hear this conversation? No. How, how was she pretending to go to work? Judge, the action is a speculation. How does he know? I believe the question calls for his observations, so the objection is overruled. You may answer the question. She would get ready in the morning, like I said. Uh, she would leave to go to work. She would come home at different times. There was no set schedule, I feel like, where... It was a nine to five job. Uh, there were times where she would leave to go to work and I would come home and like two hours later and she would be there. So that's what was throwing the red flags in my mind that she was not going to work. What would you see the defendant wear as she would leave the house for work? I, where would I see her? What would she be wearing? She would uh, be wearing her scrubs or uniform that she would wear to work on a normal basis. When Ms. Kraszewski told you that she was pretending to go to work, did that correspond with this amount of time where you would occasionally see her at the house when you thought she was at work? Yes. Okay. Do you know if Mr. Craig was ever told? I don't know. Okay. Did you ever tell him? No. Okay. In terms of, I want to talk to you a little bit about the spending habits that you noticed while living with Ms. Krzyzewski for a year, year and a half. Um, what would you say... Do you know whether Ms. Krzyzewski would buy... For example, food for the residents? Yes, she would. Was she helpful in that way? Yes. What about helping out with the kids? Yes, she did. Did she help with Mr. Craig's kids in ways other than buying things? Yes. Like how? Uh, picking his son up. Uh, bringing him back to the residence where he lived. Um, he would, uh, she would watch him, um, you know, do stuff with him, that type of thing. Do you remember there being a point in time where um, a big purchase was made by the defendant for Mr. Craig's son? There's an objection to vagueness. Overall. You, like, you may answer. Uh, yes, she did make uh, purchases that I can remember. Um, I know that there was a TV bought. There was furniture uh, bought for his son. Um, big purchases, I think that was about it. I don't know of any other big purchases. Did you have any idea how she was paying for these things? No. Okay. <clears throat> Were there occasions where you would be out in the evening with Mr. Scott and Ms. Krzyzewski? Yes. What kind of stuff would you do? We would uh, go to the local bar that we hung out at, uh, drink, have fun. Sometimes we would go to the casino. Uh, but that was pretty much the gist of me hanging out with the both of them. Okay. When you would be, and again, this was all occurring in that year, year and a half that you lived with Ms. Kraszewski? Yes. Okay, so speaking specifically to that time frame, um, what can you tell the jury about Ms. Kraszewski's spending habits when you were out at the bar that you noticed? Uh, it seemed like there was no end to the money that she had. It wasn't where 
we would go out, most people would spend a certain amount of money and they would be done for the night. They couldn't afford to spend any more. Well, with her, it was overwhelming. There was uh, always money, um, a lot of spending at the bar, a lot of buying drinks for people, food for people, that type of thing. Um, when we would uh, go to the casino, uh, like I said, there was no end to the money, it felt like. There was just constant spending. When you say food at the bars, were the bars that you frequented places that had big kitchens? No. Okay, can you explain that to the jury? It was more that we were at the bar, she would ask people if they were hungry, you know, of course people are hungry at the bar, so she would order two, three hundred dollars worth of stuff from different restaurants in the area. To, to be brought in To the be bar. brought to the bar to, you know, so we could all eat. When that would occur, did you ever see Ms. Kershessi collecting money from everyone then? No. Did she ever ask you to pay her back money for food she bought you or drinks she bought you? Typically, if she were to buy me something, I would try to pay her back. If I didn't have money, she would just tell me, don't worry about it. The bars that you were at, did they have machines that you could gamble on yes. inside? Yes. Did you ever see Ms. Kraszewski using those machines? Yes. Do you know if those require money to play? Yes. Did you observe what kind of amounts of money the defendant was using at those kind of machines? No. Okay. Were there, you said there were times that you went to the casino with Ms. Kraszewski and Mr. Craig? Yes. Um, how, about how often do you think that that occurred? Once a week. Okay. Do you remember um, during those occasions at the casino where the group would be up a lot of money consistently? Tough question to answer. Uh, depending on the day, it, Gambling is one of those things where, you know, some days are good, some days are bad. Um, there were multiple times where I saw Jesse or Scott, you know, hit a nice chunk of money. But, you know, there were so many times we were there that I can't tell you exactly the amount of money. Sure. At the casino, um, <coughs> are there ways to get money uh, if you want to take out more than would be like on an ATM limit? Yes. What, what is that way? I think that you can go up to uh, the cash register and you can pull money from them. I think you can write a check. The speculation, again, he, he thinks. We want to know what he knows. Overruled, you may question him on cross. So you said you think you can go to the cash register and then what, how do you get money from there, do you know? I have never went to the cash register to pull money out, but I'm pretty certain that you can go there and write a check and they will cash it for you. Or you can go up there with your ATM card and get uh, more money out than you can at the ATM. Did you ever see Ms. Kraszewski use that system? Yes. In terms of how much money Ms. Kraszewski would be taking out or spending at the casino, do you have a recollection of that? I have a recollection of one night that uh, she went to the cashier and she came back with $3,000. Do you ever remember being in the house 
Uh, and Ms. Kerchewski kind of complaining about money or not having money to spend on all these things? Never. Did you think that was consistent with what you knew of her employment? I'm not sure. Okay. Do you know, did you ever know Lynn mm -hmm. Herman? No. Had you heard of her before? Yes. From who? Jesse. And who did you think that was? A friend of her family's. Okay. Did you ever meet Lynn Herman? No. Okay. Did you know where she lived? Uh, somewhere in Pewaukee. When Ms. Krzyzewski would talk about Lynn Hernan, um, what would she say about her? She said that she was sick and that she was dying and in the hospital. That was pretty much about it. Would there be times when Ms. Krzyzewski would have to leave the house because of Ms. Hernan? Yes. Can you describe that to the jury, please? Jack, to, to Vagnus, how would he know where he's going when Jesse left the house? Overruled, he may answer. She would get a phone call uh, saying it was the uh, hospital and that she had to go to the hospital to either sign papers or talk with the doctor about Lynn's condition. That's what I was told. Did Ms. Kurcheski ever tell you what hospital Lynn was at? No. Okay. At, at some point, did you find out that Lynn Hernan died? Yes. Okay. Remember earlier when we talked about the discussion that you had with Ms. Kurcheski about her pretending to work? Mm hmm Is that yes. a yes? Yes. Thank Sorry. You. Was that discussion before or after Ms. Hernan died? before. Do you know if you were still living in the residence when Lynn Hernan died? No, I was not. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Cross. Thank you, Judge. So, Mr. Ratloff, is it safe to say you don't know exactly the, the months and years you lived with Mr. Craig and Jesse was in the house, do you? No. You can't give this jury an exact time frame, correct? I can tell you that it was a year prior to Lynn's death that I did live there and the five years prior to that. So that would be from 2012 to 2017? Yes, to eight, I want to say 18. Well, you heard that Lynn Hernan died October of 2018, correct? Yes. And you moved out a year prior to that? Yes, so it must be 17. So when you would see Jesse dressed in scrubs, that was in 2017, 2016, correct? Yes. And I take it you were working full time? Yes. Is that Monday through Saturday, Monday through Friday? What's your schedule? Every day of the week. Monday through Sunday? And your times was 
12-hour days? No, it ranged uh, depending on the weather, depending on our job. Every day is different. Uh, I would say anywhere from six to eight hours I would work a day. And you had a conversation with Jesse where she said she was pretending to work, correct? Yes. And this conversation occurred in 2016, 2017 while you were still at the residence? Yes. And you never told your cousin Scott no. about it? And you said the way gambling, gambling is, sometimes you win a lot of money, sometimes you lose a lot of money, correct? Yes. Sometimes you win a little bit of money, or sometimes you, you lose a little bit of money, correct? Yes. And uh, is it safe to say when you win a lot of money, you like to spend it? Yes. And you like to spend it going to bars and buying people drinks? That is for each person to decide. Fair enough. And when uh, Jesse was at the casinos, Craig, Scott Craig was usually always with her, correct? As far as I know, yes. And was Jesse went to bars, her boyfriend, Scott Craig, was with her, correct? Not always. You, can you elaborate? We had a lot of friends at the bar that were my friends, Jesse's friends, Scott's friends. If there was a night that Scott didn't want to go to the bar, Jesse would go by herself. There was nights that, you know, just me and Scott would go and Jesse would stay home. So they weren't together all the time. And there were times where you and Jesse just went to the bar? Maybe once or twice. So that was rarity, if if ever, did you and Jesse went to the bar together, correct? Yes. Thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you. All right, thank you, sir. You might step down. Can I ask Mr. Rick to be released from all subpoenas? Any objection? No, no, Judge, thank you. No objection? No objection. All right, thank you, sir. You are released from your subpoena. Statement called its next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The statement called Jacqueline Gorlowski. Good afternoon, Ms. Gorlowski. If you would please make your way to the witness stand, which is on my right, all the way to the front of the courtroom. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Jacqueline, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E, Gerlowski, G-E-R-L-O-S-K-I. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Gerlowski, how are you employed? I work at Fiserv um, Technology Company. I'm a vice president there in the legal organization. Okay. Ms. Gorlowski, do you know an individual uh, named Scott Craig? I do. How do you know him? Uh, he's my ex-husband. Okay. 
Do you know an individual named Jesse Kershevsky? I do. What is the relationship between uh, Mr. Craig and Ms. Kershevsky? Currently, or? Let's say uh, back in 2018. They were dating. Okay. Are you friendly with Mr. Craig at this point? Yes. Were you friendly with Mr. Craig um, back in 2018? Yes. Fair to say uh, during um, that time frame, you were still talking to Mr. Craig, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you and Mr. Craig have kids? Yes. Okay. How many kids do you have together? Three. Are they involved in sports or other activities? They're all adults now. Okay. When, when they were younger, were they involved in sports or other yes. activities? During those activities, uh, let's say around 2016, did you meet uh, a Jesse Kraszewski? Yes. Okay. What was your impression of her at that time? Um, I thought she was nice. <laughs> I think the first time we met was at a fast pitch softball game, and um, I didn't have much more i mean so would you, would you interact with her at those games yes in your experience with miss kershevsky was she, was she good to your children and scott's child children yes. so i want to uh, change the topics here a, a little bit here um, with your and scott's relationship would you guys get each other christmas gifts or birthday presents no. Okay. <clears throat> what about, um, like, say for Mother's Day or Father's Day, would you guys give each other presents for that, those occasions? No. Our kids were old enough that they would buy their dad something if they wanted to borrow money. Like our youngest, I would borrow her money to get dad something or from the school fair or whatever. Um, but he always had gifts, and they were typically from the kids. I want to direct your attention to uh, Mother's Day, for instance, here. Um, did you receive a gift from Jesse Kershevsky on a Mother's Day? I did. Can you tell the jury what that was? Check the vagueness at the time. Overall. I received a, um, a delivery of a dozen roses and my youngest, my fourth child with my new husband, was already born. I remember that. And the card was from all the kids. So Alex, Dominic, Bella, and Violet. And there was a gift card uh, for $100 for a, um, a spa gift card. And I was taken aback because I had already gotten gifts from my kids. And my husband was also like, wow. And that was not the um, normal behavior from my ex-husband, even when we were married, <laughs> let the record reflect. Uh, so I called him and I said, well, thank you for this. Because I said to the kids, "Did what is this? And they said, oh, I'm sure it was from Jesse. And so I called Scott and he goes, you know Jesse. And I said, well, thanks. It was weird, but a nicety, weird, but weird. Okay. I want to direct your attention now to like uh, the Christmas time. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, would Jesse get your children gifts? Yes. Can you tell the jury a little bit about those gifts? So they had very good Christmases when, when Jesse was there. They always had good Christmases, but they had Christmases that were plentiful. Um, so we did not, you know, we had our kids very young, so we were young. We didn't have a lot of money. And we got them a lot of gifts, but it was small gifts, so they had a lot to open. That was always important to my ex-husband. But when they had Christmas with Jesse and Scott, it was multiple pairs of very expensive shoes or electronics or a combination of all those things. And so they would have Christmas Eve at their dad's and then they'd come back to my house Christmas morning and tell me everything they got. And 
I thought, why did I even buy anything? I got so much, you know, like what? That's weird. And that wasn't normal behavior before Jesse. She was a gift giver. At, at some point during this time frame when Jesse was with Scott, um, was your daughter uh, Alex overseas? Yes. Uh, was she studying overseas? She had graduated from UW-Madison and um, was going to travel abroad and then teach in Thailand okay. for the last six months. I, or last year, she was traveling for 18 months. Were you planning to go see uh, your daughter? No. Okay. At any point, did Jesse offer to pay for a flight to Thailand? She did, and it was probably because I was saying how much I missed her or I, I can't really remember how that unfolded but I remember the offer and when she offered I thought to myself I, I, you're not even working like how are you offering to pay for me to go to Thailand which I of course would never accept and did not but it was very odd to me and then I I always thought she just had a credit card spending problem. Like I, did, I couldn't rationalize in my head how she could afford what she could afford. But again, most of it was for my kids. And I thought, well, it's, what, it's none of my business. I mean, if it's, I mean, I didn't say anything or. Okay. Ms. Kralowski, have you heard the name Lynn Hernan before? I have. Did you hear that name from Jesse Kraszewski? Yes. In what capacity would you hear about Lynn Hernan from Ms. Kraszewski? I think the first time that I heard about Lynn was when she was ill and in the ICU, because I believe that spanned over a summer that we were together almost every weekend for fast pitch. So, and we sat together. Um, at those tournaments. Did she talk to you about Lynn's health issues? Not in detail during the games. It was just, I think, how's Lynn doing? Um, and it wasn't anything in grave detail other than she's still in ICU. And, and I recall the kids saying that to me as well. Did she ever get into to detail about why she was in the ICU, if you recall? Josh, you asked to answer. Overruled. She may answer. I can't recall if we had that conversation or not. During that summer, do you recall having a conversation with Ms. Kershevsky about a do not resuscitate order with Lynn? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that conversation? So I um, pulled up to my ex-husband's house to either drop off or pick up my, my daughter, my youngest, and Jesse came out to my car and was frazzled, was upset. And she said, I, I can't believe it. Freighter um, did not, I can't remember the exact words. It was something to the effect of, they brought Lynn back to life. She had a do not resuscitate and they brought her back to life. Is there anything I can do? And I said, I, I don't know. Um, do you have an attorney? Maybe get an attorney. And it was just odd. It was an odd conversation. And I, I think I advised her to get an attorney. And she said that she would, or she had one, but it was a very odd conversation. Ultimately, do you, did you get any follow-up from Jesse about what happened with the hospital and the do not resuscitate? Yes, so I can't tell you how many, how, what the time period was, maybe a few weeks, maybe a month. She had said that they settled with Freightert and um, they freighter had agreed not to charge Lynn for any of her stay after that day. And <laughs> I, in my mind, I said that would never happen. 
Um, nothing happens that fast with a company like Freighter. But I didn't, again, I didn't engage like and say, well, that's not true. Like I, I was like, oh, well, I'm glad you guys settled it. And that was it. I mean, my conversations were limited, but I, that was also very weird. Thank you, Ms. Kurlowski. I don't have anything else. Nick Cross. Yes, Judge, just a few questions. Ms. Kurlowski, you indicated that Jesse was a nice person, correct? Yes. She treated your kids great, correct? She treated them very good. When you're, you and Scott would have the kids every other weekend? Uh, every other week. And this started when? What year? Um, geez. We, we got, do you mean when we got divorced? 2010, I think. Well, again, you have four, three kids with, with Scott, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And back in 2016, how old are they? Oh, boy. Can you give me the name of your three kids? Alexandria, born in 1994. Dominic, born in 1995. Isabella, born in 2003. And math is not my forte. That's okay. So your youngest, how old was Isabella when you met Jesse? If you can remember. Well, if I met her in 2017, they started dating. Would somebody say yes to that so I can do the math in my head? It might take a while. From your memory, from your record. I think she was 10. 2003, she was born. Thirteen. Oh, that's okay. Who was, the, who was the child that was in fast pitch? Isabel. So a Alexandria and Dominic, they were like okay. y young adults. Yes. Alexander was was studying abroad during that time. I believe so. She she graduated Madison December of 2016 and left the January after December. So she left in January of 2017. And Dominic must have been in high school or graduated from high school. What year? 2017. So he was in UW um, Eau Claire in his last year. He graduated in December of 2017. So the only child that you were exchanging with Mr. Craig was Isabella? That's correct. And I think you trusted Je Isabella in, Je in Jesse's care. Absolutely, I never would have let her be there if I didn't. The Christmas said. Scott and Jesse got your kids or child expensive shoes. Do you remember what Christmas that was, 2017? I could only guess. I don't know. The year you got the $100 spa gift, do you remember what year that was? Well, my youngest child was born in March of 2017, so she was a, she was um, alive. But it had to be 2017 or 2018. <coughs> Ms. 
the year that you're meeting Jesse for fast pitch softball, I think you said it was. What year was that? I don't recall. Did you meet with her often for fast pitch softball? We sat together. So if they had chairs up, my husband and I would put our chairs by them or vice versa. If we were there first, they would come and set their chairs next to us. And I take it she went there with Scott to see your child play so fast pitch? Yes. And that was the only reason she went there, to see your child play fast pitch, correct? I would assume so. Did, by her demeanor, did she appear to enjoy watching your, son, your child play? Yes. Regarding this trip for offer to pay your ticket to go to visit your daughter overseas, did you tell Scott about that? I don't recall. So you found it strange, but you didn't tell Scott about it, correct? He may have been there when she offered. I can't really remember. I don't, that was a long time ago. Thank you. Okay. Any redirect? No, Your Honor, I'd be asking that you be released from your subpoena. No objection. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down and you are released from your subpoena. State may call its next witness, please. State calls Alex Craig. Good afternoon. If you would please make your way to the witness stand, which is all the way to the front. It is up a riser. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, who is on my left across from you, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you. The first thing I will have you do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Okay. Alexandria Craig, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-I-A-C-R-A-I-G. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Ms. Craig, are you working right now? I am. What kind of work do you do? I'm in corporate philanthropy. Okay. Could you tell the jury where you went to college? Yes, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. When did you graduate from there? December 2016. What did you study? Biomedical engineering. Who is your dad? Scott Craig. Okay. What about your mom? Jacqueline Thompson, now Gerlowski. So when you graduated in December of 2016, what did you do next in your life? Uh, I hard pivoted and uh, moved to Thailand. Okay. Was that right away still in 2016? No, um, I stuck around for a little bit in 2016 in December, took a trip to Spain and Italy, and then came back for a couple weeks. January 2017, I left and moved to Southeast Asia. In January of 2017? Yes. Okay. What were you doing in Thailand? I was a teacher. Okay. How long did you live there? Uh, almost a year. Okay. At some point in time, did you meet Jesse Krasowski? I did. 
kind of within the timeline that we've already laid out, mm -hmm. when do you think that you met her? I remember at least being around her in December of 2016, that Christmas, and at my graduation. Okay. Have you ever, at any point in time, were you ever living with your dad and Miss Krzyzewski? No. Okay. So, <clears throat> what was your impression of Miss Krzyzewski when you met her kind of around your graduation that year in 2016? She seemed kind, generous, um, candidly annoying, but a, a nice enough person to be with my dad. Okay. Did you spend a lot of time at the home uh, where your dad lived? When? Uh, before you lived in Thailand? No. When you graduated from Madison, were you living in Madison? After I graduated, I moved back home and I was living with my mom before I left. Okay. Once you were in Thailand, did you keep in contact with your family? Yes. How did you do that? Um, FaceTime almost every single day. Okay. Yeah. Did that include with your dad, Scott? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, were there occasions when you would also speak with Miss Kershawski while you were in Thailand? Uh, she would be on the phone in the background, but I never s desired to speak to her directly. Okay. So um, during that time, were you also keeping in touch with your mom? Yes. Did you miss her? Yeah. Okay. Did your mom ever come visit you in Thailand? No. Do you know whether, um, do you recall a conversation where that came up, having your mom Judge, visit you? Did you object to relevance? Overruled. You can answer. What was the question? I'm sorry. Do you recall a discussion that involved whether your mom would come visit you in Thailand involving the defendant? Judge, you object us to hearsay. Overruled. Answer the specific question about whether there was a conversation first. There was a conversation, and I was a part of it. Was that a remote conversation? Remote as in over the phone? Right. From what I recall, yes. Okay. Do you remember when that conversation happened? Were you already in Thailand? I don't recall. Okay. Was Ms. Kershawski involved in that conversation? Yes. And what did she say about it? She had offered to fly my mom out to Thailand to see me. In 2017, if you had to estimate what a plane ticket to Thailand cost you, what would you say? Uh, round trip, at least eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Was that offer from Miss Kerchewski consistent with other spending you had seen her engage in? Yes. Could you talk about that for the jury, please? Yes. Um, she was a very generous spender and gift giver. She would always be offering to buy things to, um, we would be out to eat and she would want to pick up the tab or offer to get things for us, um, things even we didn't really need, but was just, seemed very overly generous, I'll say that. Even directly to you? In ways, yes. What about, like, let's talk about holidays, for example. How sure. would you describe holidays that involved Miss Kraszewski? Yes, um, they were always very over the top. Um, we come from a working class family, so we, we, we like holidays and we try to do, you know, as growing up, do our best and, and have a lot of presents under the tree. But um, the Christmases, you know, Jesse was a part of, they were always 
a little bit more extravagant with more extravagant gifts than we're used to or the Easter baskets were much fuller or things along those lines where I could tell that it was not just my dad that went and spent that money. It was um, Jesse spending money and and I had believed it was because she, you know, wanted to have us have good holidays. Okay. During these times, what was your understanding of what Ms. Kroszewski did for work? Um, I had known that she, or I had thought that she had worked at some type of clinic, dental clinic or medical clinic. Do you recall um, Ms. Kroszewski having a consistent job throughout the entire time you knew of her? Jack, this witness was never living in, in the house. Overruled, she may answer. You can cross on that. I don't, I don't recall. Okay. Did you ever have an understanding of the source of the money being used to buy these gifts and things? Objection, big. Overruled. Re relevance. Overruled. Um, I had an idea, um, but it wasn't something that was concrete. Did Ms. Kroszewski ever tell you anything about where she would get money to spend? She had mentioned she had a family friend that gave her money, but I did not pry. Do you recall ever hearing about someone named Lynn Hernan? Yes. Uh, who told you about Lynn Hernan? Jesse. Do you know about when that would have been? Um, when I had, I returned from overseas around April, May 2018. So it was during that summer where I had started to hear more about Lynn. And what were you being told about her? I was told that she was very, very sick. That it was a friend that Jesse was taking care of, um, and that consumed a lot of Jesse's time, and that she was taking care of her sick friend. Do you know where Lynn was located? I knew that she had lived in Pewaukee. Okay. When. Would there be occasions when you were at the house and Jesse would have to go to care for Lynn? Yes. Do you know where she was going to do that? She, I have, I remembered that she either was going to the hospital at the times she had mentioned Lynn was in the hospital or she was going to Lynn's residence in Pewaukee. Okay. Do you remember what hospital Ms. Kroszewski told you Lynn was at? Um... I believe it was freighter, but I can't be 100% sure. Regardless, do you remember Ms. Kroszewski telling you why Lynn was at a hospital? She had said that she was sick, had depression, had liver disease. Um, I believe that was the extent of it. Okay. Do you remember <coughs> the defendant telling you about a do not resuscitate? I don't object to the name that the prosecutor's given to my client. Sustained. Please rephrase. Do you recall Ms. Kershawski telling you about a do not resuscitate involving Lynn Hernan? Yes. And what did she say about that? She had said that Lynn had a do not resuscitate order, that the hospital resuscitated her against those wishes, and that they were going to sue the hospital or something along those lines. Did Ms. Kroszewski ever talk to you again about that topic? Yes, she had brought it back up and again, said, and I'm paraphrasing, said something along the lines of, 
the case was settled. They're paying her medical fees. Who's paying whose medical fees? Sorry, um, that the the hospital administrators are going to be paying Lynn's medical fees and her remaining stay in the hospital because they resuscitated her against her wishes. At that point in time, what was your understanding about the length of time Ms. Hernan had been in that hospital? Um, my understanding was limited. I had thought a couple months, but again, the topic seemed to upset Jesse, so I did not pry. Okay. Could you give the jury an estimate about how much time you think passed between Ms. Krzyzewski mentioning the do not resuscitate and then the, the settlement? I can't recall. Okay. <clears throat> Did there become a point in time when you found out Lynn Hernan died? Yes. Was that in October of 2018? Yes. Where were you living at that point in time, generally? I was still living at my mom's. Okay. Do you remember talking to Ms. Kraszewski about how Ms. Hernan died? I don't remember. Okay. Did you ever go to a residence in Pewaukee that you believed was Lynn Hernan's residence? Yes. Who did you go there with? Jesse, my dad, and my friend Danielle. Okay. Would that be before or after the death? After. Why did you go there? My friend Danielle and I were moving into an apartment and we were really excited. Um, and Jesse had brought us to Lynn's apartment to procure any items that we would want to take from her apartment for our own. Had you ever met Lynn Hernan before she died? No. Did you ever go to any kind of funeral service for Lynn Hernan? No. Did you know why Ms. Krzyzewski wanted, offered to bring you to that condo? She knew that we were moving into a new place and that she had said Lynn had a lot of items and things that she was going to sell anyways in an estate sale and that anything that we wanted for our own apartment we could have. So I think she, it was an offer trying to be generous and save me some money. Did Ms. Kroszewski seem to be handling quite a bit of the estate at that point? Yes. Did Ms. Kroszewski tell you why she was so involved in it at that point? Yes. She had mentioned she had some kind of power or um, that she was involved in the estate in some way. Did you have a lot of details about that? No, I, I didn't ask too many questions. Do you remember taking anything from the residence? Yes. What was that? Um, a entertainment stand, a some some shelving units, um, I believe a washer and dryer, um, and there might have been a few other things as well, but those are the big ones. Okay. I want to ask you a little bit more uh, about your dad's relationship with Ms. Kraszewski. Okay. Um, prior to the relationship, did you know your dad to be a frequent gambler? No. Once the relationship began, did you notice there was more gambling that went on? We don't object to relevance. Overruled. Yes. What kind of things did you notice? That they would be going to the casino more, um, 
or he would be going with her more um, that, you know, when I would meet them out at a pub or a restaurant that um, there'd be more gambling then to pull tabs, slot machines, stuff like that. Do you ever remember Ms. Krzyzewski telling you why Lynn Hernan died or how Lynn Hernan died? Um, she just had said she was very sick and, and succumbed to her sickness, I would say. That's all I have, thank you. Any cross? Just a few questions, Judge. Go ahead. When you use the word succumb, that's your words, correct? Yes. The Thailand trip, that never occurred, did it? What? The Thailand trip, that, that didn't occur, did it? Me going? No, anybody going, like your mom going to Thailand. Did, was those tickets purchased? She did not go, no. Prior to just your dad meeting Jesse, your dad mm -hmm. lived alone? No. Who did he live with? My uncle Dan. So is this your dad and your uncle your dad and your uncle? And my other siblings, yes. And during that time your dad would just give you and the other siblings just little gifts? In what regard? Did you get like presents from your dad? For like birthdays and Christmas? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Did you get presents from your uncle? Um, no. And those presents continue when your dad met Jesse, correct? Yes, we continue to have Christmases. And presents from your dad and Jesse? Yes. I have no further questions. Thank you. Can I read your rep? No. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. I got this witness to release from all subpoenas. No objection. Thank you. You're released from your subpoenas. Um, do you have another short witness or should we take a break? I think we have our next short witness here. Let me just check very quickly. Who would be short? Sir? All right. Uh, why don't you just stand for a minute, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? <coughs> Have you called this next witness, and then we'll take our, our uh, afternoon break. Thank you, and we are calling Christina Sharrock. Good afternoon, Ms. Chirac. If you please make your way all the way to the front to the witness stand, it is up one riser. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Thank you. Have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Christina Chirac, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. S H E R O C K. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you. And Mr. Rock, just before we get started with questions, can you just move a little closer to the microphone because you're sure. a little hard to hear back here. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Mr. Rock, what do you do for a living? I work in the bar industry. And uh, any specific bars currently? Um, fourth and Long. Okay. 
And how long have you been in the bar industry? 16 years. Through that employment, did you meet a person named Jesse Krzyzewski? Yes, I did. How long ago would you say you met Miss Krzyzewski? Uh, probably like 14 years ago. Was it just from frequenting bars and being in the same friend circle or something different? Well, first she was frequent, um, she was a frequent person at my bar or at the bar that I worked at and then she worked there. And then she just frequented afterwards, after she was no longer working there. Okay, so 14 years, uh, sort of what's the end of that 14 years if you had to put a year on it? When she was put in, in jail. Okay, so if you heard earlier that was 2019, is that fair? Yep. So we're talking about 2005 until 2019. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yep. Okay, thank you. Now, Towards the latter part of that 14 year time span, uh, were you still working at bars that Ms. Krzyzewski would come to as a customer? Yep. And uh, what bar was that? Scotty's. Scotty's Pub. Mm -hmm. And is that a yes? Yes. I'm sorry, the woman in front of you is just taking down all your answers so we need yeses and noes and things of that nature, okay? <laughs> okay. Thank you. So Scotty's Pub, that's where you would be working and Ms. Krzyzewski would come as a customer? Yep. Were there other times where you would go to bars as friends together? I would see her at bars and meet her there. Okay, so you wouldn't necessarily go in the same group, but you would frequent, as customers, other bars? Yes. Do you know what some of those were? Um, Stalas Palace. Okay, and, and I assume that's in West Dallas? Yes. Okay. Um, was there a lot of opportunities for you to talk to Ms. Krzyzewski throughout the years? I mean, sometimes we did, yeah. Okay. In talking with Ms. Krzyzewski, did the name Lynn Hernan ever come up? A, a couple times. Okay. What do you remember about those couple times? Um, she was just saying that she was helping her mom take care of uh, her best friend. And something about she had a bunch of cats. She had to get rid of some of the cats. And, I mean, she didn't really tell me that much at all. Okay. And you said that at some point she went from being a customer to working with you at a bar? Mm-hmm. Was correct. that sorry, is that a yes? Yes, correct. Thank you. Was that Scotty's pub? Yes. How long would you say you worked together there? That I don't know. Okay. If you had to try your best, would you say a year, more than a year, less than a year? Probably about a year. About a year. Okay. Do you know if Miss Krzyzewski was working other jobs at the time? I, no, I don't. Okay. Do you recall approximately what year that was? No, I okay. couldn't tell you that. Was it more towards the beginning of that 2005 to 2019, towards the middle or towards the end? Towards the beginning. Towards the beginning, so yeah. closer to 2005. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. That's okay, I understand. <laughs> I'll try my best to keep correcting you. <laughs> so, beyond working together, when she sort of returned back to being a customer, of Scotty's Pub where you worked. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Did you notice her spending habits at all? Well, I know she always liked to gamble, yeah, and then she would buy rounds of shots for okay. all of her friends and stuff at the bar. Okay, and you said sometimes you would see her at bars while you yourself were a customer, correct? Yes. You wouldn't necessarily go with her? No, I, we would be just be at the bars t together, like a Sunday fun day or Something like that. Understood. It was more just a coincidence that you'd end up together. Yeah. So when you say Miss Krzyzewski would buy rounds of shots or things like that, was it for the group she came with or was it for everybody in the bar or something different? Sometimes it was just for the group that she came with. Sometimes if there wasn't many people at the bar or whatever, she would buy around for the whole bar. Okay. And how many people were in there when it was the whole bar? I mean, sometimes it got up to 10, 15 people. Okay. You said she also liked to use the gambling machines or the video poker machines? Yes. Did you ever kind of notice or pay attention how much money she was putting in those machines? No, because I was usually right next to her and I was just playing myself, so I didn't recognize how much she, she put in there. Um, one of the few times she did talk about Lynn Hernan, was that to tell you that uh, her family friend had passed away? Yeah, she did tell me that. And in that conversation, did Ms. Krzyzewski sort of offer you um, personal items of Lynn Hernan? Yes, she did. 
And were you able to follow through with that and, and take anything? Yes. Do you recall what items you took? Um, a bu bunch of bags of clothes and then, like, I think a couple end tables. Okay. And do you recall about when that was? Mm, no, I don't know. Do you and it was right after one of the hurricanes because I took it down to the people for the hurricanes, so probably October, November. Okay. Of 2018 still or something different? Yeah, that would have been of 18. Okay. No, so that, would, it, that would have been 19. So you think it was October of, or November yeah. of 2000? Right after she passed away. Okay, right after she had told, Yeah, she away. had told me after I told her I was going down south that she had clothes of, of Lynn's. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Those are all the questions. No problem. You hung around with Jesse, you said around 2005? Well, I, would saw, I saw her at the bars. So this period that you're talking about is around the early part of your relationship with Jesse, around 2005, 2006? No, I would see her at bars along the way. and I mean, we never said we're going to a bar together. We would always just meet because we liked a certain bartender or whatnot. Right. Or when I was bartending, she would come up there. And you seem to indicate this happened in the early part of your meeting with Jesse Rome, the towards the 2005 time, time frame. What was the question? You seem to indicate that this get-together with Jesse occurred during the early part of the time that you met her, towards 2005. No, that's when she started working for Scotty's, sometime around then. I'm not sure that when she actually started. But I met her, and then that's how, I mean, through people and whatnot, we didn't have, like, conversations back then. I just knew who she was. So you really didn't start hanging around with her in 2005? No. That's when I, you just first met her? Yep. When did you start hanging around with her? Uh, after she started working there. Do you know when that was, 2007, 8? I don't know. The, People come come and go at the bars when I mean she was a waitress but that we I did get to know her I try to get to know people that I work with so but she did tell you you remember her telling you that she was taking care of a person named Lynn Hernan correct yes and Lynn Hernan was very sick I didn't know she was sick. She just said she was helping take care of her. And Lynn Hernan had, had cats. Mm-hmm. I remember yes. saying because she had to get rid of the cats. Did you know that those cats were taken by her mother, Jennifer Flower? Check. Speculation and relevance. Overruled. If she knows, she may answer. No. I have no further questions. Judge, thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. You may step down. I would ask that Mr. Rock be released from your subpoenas as well. No objection. All right, thank you, ma'am. You are released from your subpoenas. And now we'll take our uh, mid afternoon break. I'll rise for the jury, please. If it can be clarified now, this would be great. Uh, during 
Scott Craig's testimony, the state referenced Exhibit 183. It was shown, it was marked, it was not received. And then during his cross-examination, it appeared he was being questioned regarding text messages. The defense referred to the exhibit as 186, but I believe it was 183. Um, so do I have that correct, anyone from the state? You do have that correct. There is a 186 that's more of a demonstrative PowerPoint with text messages, excerpts from the raw data. 183 that I showed him until it was objected to was the raw data with all the messages in sequential order. Um, they will be coming in through. Is that a question from the jury or just from the court? No, I just wanted to make sure that our notes were correct, Madam Clerk. Uh, wanted to confirm because typically even when an exhibit has not been received, if it's used like it was to refresh recollection, it's at a minimum marked. And so I wanted to make sure we had it in the record. So uh, I think that was Attorney Kukler doing the questioning. Do you know if you were using the excerpt from 186 or 183? I think I was using 186. Can you please be sure and then... Computer anymore. That's a problem. Well, this that's where I had it brought up on my computer. That's just my recollection right now. It was after lunch that this came up. I believe. After, oh, then it's on Attorney Galavis's computer. Right. So if you want to, you can do it during the break. I just want to make sure the record's clear. And if we, if you happen to have been using 183, I'd like to let the jury know that to clarify their notes. That's all. All right. We'll be in recess then, about 15, 20 minutes then. Be back. Just one issue. We do have another witness on the way. Um, oh. I expect he'll be here after the break, but I didn't know if there was an earlier issue with Attorney Kukler's computer or not. It was sort of left in. We'll have to address it after the slate of witnesses. Who's the next witness? Uh, Officer Ryan Soley. All right. Any issue with that, with the computer issue? This is Attorney Galavis's, Galavis's witness, so I'll let him address that one. But I, I, we were not informed about this potential witness for today, I can say that. And this is on one of the other acts situations, I think. So I think we're we moving should have ahead advanced, of schedule. I, so. I do think we should have advanced notice on something that significant. Um, we, he will testify. We're going to keep this going. I'm not holding up this case for that. It is really a courtesy. I understand things are fluid. He's on the witness list. He's a subject of at least his testimony regarding another acts motion. There's absolutely no surprise to the defense. We're in recess. Thank you.
State have the next witness? Yes. Okay. We'll bring the jury out and go ahead. Um, I've got my computer and things up there, and somebody from my office, I understand, is on their way. Oh, no problem. Okay, and they, I just um, want you to know. No problem. Okay. I understand. All right. Very good. Judge, did you want to talk about Scott Craig's dual subpoena? At the end of the day. At the end of the day. Thank you. We're on a roll. Let's keep going. Understood. Did we ever look at 183 versus 186, though? Yes, it was 183. All right. At some point, we should let the jury know that. Do it at the end. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. All right, the state may call its next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state would call Brian Soley. Come on up, sir. Please make your way to the witness stand, which is all the way up to the front. Up a riser. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will have you do is to state your first and last names for the record and then spell each. Okay. My name is Ryan Soley. First name R-Y-A-N. Last name S-O-L-I-E. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Mr. Soley, how are you employed? I work for Wisconsin Lutheran High School. In what capacity? I'm the director of school safety. All right. Going back to July of 2010, how were you employed? I was a police officer for the city of West Dallas. How long were you employed with the city of West Dallas at that point? Uh, about three, four years. Okay. On July 16th, 2010, were you dispatched to a payday loans? Yes. What were you dispatched to that location for? I believe someone was trying to fraudulently obtain some type of title loan. Okay. Ultimately, when you were dispatched to that location, did you meet with other officers to get briefed on the situation? I did. Okay. Did you make contact with the suspect of that case? I did. Who was the suspect? Um, Jesse Krzyzewski. If I would say it's Karshevsky, would you have any issues with that? No. Okay. So you ended up speaking with Ms. Karshevsky, correct? Correct. Okay. What did you talk to her about? Uh, well, employees on scene were worried that she was trying to fraudulently obtain a loan. Um, she provided, uh, initially provided her um, identification and stated that she was Jennifer Flower. She showed me um, a picture ID of a Jennifer Flower, which did not look like um, Jesse. So I questioned her further on that. What happened at that point? Uh, she eventually admitted that Jennifer Flower was her mother and she was there trying to uh, obtain a title loan on her behalf. Ultimately, was Ms. Kershawski taken into custody? Yes. Okay. Before uh, we get to that point, though, uh, was a search of the vehicle that Ms. Kershawski took to that location done? Yes. Was 
Identification relating to Miss uh, Jennifer Flower located in that vehicle? Yes. Could you explain to the jury what was found in the vehicle belonging to Miss Flower? Uh, from what I recall, um, her social security card was in there. Um, I'm not exactly sure what else we located in there. If there were... Uh, if I were to show you uh, your report from 2010, would that help refresh your recollection about what was found in the vehicle? Yes. I'll get this marked as an exhibit um, after this. Uh, it'll be 218. It's uh, Officer Soli's report from this incident. All right. How about 219? 219. Okay. Uh, did you show it to Attorney Galavis? Yes. All right, go ahead. Mr. Soli, I'm going to hand you what's going to be marked later as Exhibit 219. Um, and I'm going to ask you to review the last uh, bullet points, and then once you're done with that, turn it over and hand it to me. Does that help refresh your recollection? Yes. After reviewing that, what other items of Ms. Flower did you, was located in the vehicle? Uh, her checkbook from her bank account. Uh, there was also some sort of letter from um, a company stating that uh, a loan was approved. All right. So ultimately, Ms. Kraszewski was taken into custody, correct? Yes. Was a interview conducted with Ms. Kershawski? Yes. During that interview, did she talk to you about of trying to obtain that car loan? Yes. What did she say about it? She stated that um, she was trying to use her mom's information to obtain this loan. Uh, her mom did not have any knowledge of her doing this. I believe she mentioned something about um, like gambling debt, being in gambling debt, and that's why she had to do this. I don't know if you specifically stated it. Uh, did Ms. Kraszewski have the consent of Ms. Flower to uh, use her information to apply for this loan? No. Attorney Galavis, cross. No questions. Thank no you, questions? Sir. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down. You're already asking that he be uh, released from his subpoena. Objection. All right, thank you, sir. You are released from your subpoena. All right, you can call your next witness. Judge, we are ahead of schedule and have no other witnesses available today to call. All right, then. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you're going to get a little bit of an early start to the evening. We'll commence tomorrow as close as we can to 8.30 a.m. We do want to read the instruction. I know you've heard it. My goal by the end of this is that you can recite it with me. <laughs> Just kidding on the last part. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do not begin your deliberations and discussion of the case until all the evidence is presented, and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. This order is not limited to face-to-face -face conversations. It also extends to all forms of electronic communications. 
Do not use any electronic devices, such as a mobile phone or computer, text or instant messaging, or social networking sites to send or receive any information about this case or your experience as a juror. We will stop or recess from time to time during the trial. You may be excused from the courtroom when it is necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. If you come in contact with the parties, lawyers, or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, lawyers, and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversations about this case. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene, either in person or by any electronic means. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio, television, over the internet, or any other electronic application or tool about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, electronic applications, social media, the internet, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public records of any party or witness in this case. Any information you obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have an opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on this jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device, including personal wearable electronics, applications, or tools with communication capabilities to share any information about this case. For example, do not communicate by telephone, blog post, email, text message, instant message, social media post, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by any other means. If anyone does so, despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. I appreciate that it is tempting when you go home in the evening to discuss this case with another member of your household, but you may not do so. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence, and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After this trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. With that, you are excused, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you. All right, thank you. Be seated. Uh, we'll take up the issue of the dual subpoenas to Mr. Craig, as I indicated earlier. Um, since you've now had an opportunity to uh, obviously hear the state's questions on direct, cross-examine him. I know he's under subpoena, but what reason does the defense have other than the generic reason that's been proffered earlier today to not release him from his subpoena. And who will be addressing that for the defense? I will. Go ahead. Well, again, we want to assess uh, the case at the conclusion of the state's case. Um, there are potentially other text messages 
that I'm going to want to go into. Unfortunately, part of the problem with this witness also was that my computer broke over, my screen broke on my computer over the lunch hour. So I had prepped for a couple things that I had quickly sent over during the lunch hour to Attorney Gallaby's, um, but I had the full, uh, full packet of information on this particular witness. So I dealt with what I thought was most important, but there could be others. Uh, I just couldn't look at them over, over the lunch hour because my computer was broken. Um, so there would be potentially other text messages. And response from the state. Judge, as far as the text messages, when we attempted to get into the specifics of them, it was Attorney Kukler who objected to that. They certainly will come in. The foundation will be laid through, I believe, either Detective Fredericks or Detective Schrader. Um, and then, as I see it, they'll be in. There'll be a certified copy of the phone downloads from Ms. Kraszewski and Mr. Craig. Um, Again, we could have explored that today. It was Attorney Kukler's objection that kept us from those. Um, and so I, I simply am not hearing a reason why Mr. Craig would need to be called back. Certainly the defense added two exhibits this morning, I would add to the record, that were his recorded interviews that they appeared ready and able to play portions of if he had trouble remembering something or testified differently than he did back in 2019 when he was interviewed and I think the next interview was 2021 perhaps but several years ago and uh, they had those opportunities today and there's just nothing being brought up as to what they did not have the opportunity to ask him during his testimony today. I just think we have the, the right to call somebody in our case in chief and present our evidence in the way we want to. But you're telling me you did not take the opportunity earlier to question him regarding text messages, um, which would have been a proper subject of cross-exam. I know there was an objection by Attorney Kukler uh, to showing the witness text messages Frankly, from my perspective, um, although you may link this up later, um, there were some issues with foundation, um, including that this witness never testified to what his phone number was or how he had labeled, if any, uh, Ms. Kershevsky's contact in his phone. I've certainly seen enough of these records to know um, how these things typically uh, are displayed in the format they are. I understand you'll need a detective, though, to further go through that foundation in terms of why it's in the format that it is versus a cell phone, for example. Um, so given that, and there might still be I need for some of these things. I'll honor the request of the defense as it relates to this particular witness, give him some leeway, give him some of the computer issues. I know that uh, Attorney Kukler and Attorney Galavis were able to get um, a number of documents um, by email, uh, but this is a complicated case. It's scheduled for 25 days. There's volumes and volumes of discovery. At one point, it was described to me as being on a terabyte, and I think having a computer with your prep not available uh, is reason sufficient as it relates to this witness. So I will keep him under subpoena. He continues to be under the exclusion uh, rule that I set up earlier. With that, is there anything else from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No. All right, thank you everyone. We are in recess for the day. Um, please make sure when you come in tomorrow, I want both parties to test out the equipment before we bring the jury in. Sometimes there's a delay, sometimes cords aren't in the right place, but uh, let's make sure everyone gets here early uh, to do that. That should be done both in the morning and in the afternoon. And then I had a note, but kind of threw me with getting done early. So I'll tell the jury tomorrow about 183 being the correct 
document that was utilized during Mr. Craig's testimony. All right, thank you everyone.